let's get into some space news. Oh, I just got to take a break real quick, and then we'll uh, we'll jump into it. I'll be back momentarily. Just got to refill my coffee, and we'll have a little little talk about Kessler syndrome and a couple of other things. I'll be back in a moment. Actually, you know what we should do? Let's get a let's get a, let's get an info movie going, shall we? Let's see. What do we want? Let's see. Let's see. Ah, I got one. I got one here. Here we go. Heat. Tough on men. Hard on everything in the world. Heat is hard on engines. That's why every car has a cooling system. Did you ever wonder where the water goes in the cooling system of your automobile? The water goes down through the radiator, then to the water pump, which forces it on. Then it enters the engine. Once in the engine, 
This river of water flows first through the jackets around the cylinders, uniformly cooling the six cylinder walls. Next, the stream goes up into the cylinder head where its direction is so controlled as to drive it against the valve seats. Leaving the valve seats, it circulates through the head and after it has done all the cooling it can do, the water comes out through the hose at the top and flows back into the radiator. Even though Emily Post may never approve it as good etiquette, the well-known business of cooling coffee in a saucer is an excellent illustration of what happens in the radiator of your car. In the saucer, the hot coffee is spread out thin over a large area so that the heat has a chance to escape. Cold is only the absence of heat, and heat doesn't just disappear. It has to be carried away through the air. Now, if you blow on the coffee, <laughs> that helps a lot. Even more heat is carried away by the greater circulation of air. That's why large surfaces help heat to escape fast. More liquid is exposed to the air. More heat is carried away. Now let's put a cover on the saucer. Stand it up on end. Run tubes through it like this. Put a fan over here. And what have we? A radiator, a big surface, plus air circulation. That's what carries away the heat from the water in the radiator of your car. As you can see by the smoke, air is pulled quickly over all the surfaces of the radiator by the action of the fan, which also circulates air around the engine. As the engine gets up speed, we get additional help in cooling. Air is forced more rapidly through the radiator. After a certain speed is reached, we could do without the fan. But inside the engine is where the water does its work. The temperature inside an automobile engine is just as important to the engine as the temperature of a room is to people. In an air-conditioned room, the temperature is ideal for human beings, pretty close to 70 degrees. But in another room, the thermometer is up to 90 degrees and nobody likes it. It's too hot for comfort, but even a temperature that seems hot to us would be cold to the engine of an automobile. The temperature an automobile engine likes best isn't 70 degrees, nor 90, nor even 100. A gasoline engine likes 180 degrees best, summer or winter. And that's just the way the water is when it leaves the engine. Each part inside the engine has a particular temperature at which it operates best. In the water jacket, close to the cylinder wall, it's 212 degrees, just hot enough to boil water. Between the piston and cylinder wall, the temperature is about 350. And inside the metal, in the top of the piston, it's about 600 degrees, hot enough to boil mercury. Up in the combustion chamber, where the gasoline burns, the temperature is about 3,000 degrees and that's hot enough to melt steel and then some. That whole working gang inside the engine has to have just the right amount of water in order to keep operating at just the right temperatures, neither too hot nor too cold. What would happen if they didn't get that water? Well, we all know what happens to metal when it gets hot. When steel gets hot, it expands. That's why there is a gap between rails in a railroad track. The gap protects the rails from buckling when they get hot and expand. Foundries use the same principle in making locomotive wheels. The flange is heated until it expands, then it is slipped over the wheel so that when it cools, the flange will contract again and fit tightly over the wheel. The metal inside an automobile engine also expands when it gets hot. And if all the water suddenly boiled away, every part in the engine would overexpand. Then nothing could move, and the engine would almost melt. It would be ruined. That's why it's important to keep your radiator always full. The valves, which let the fuel in and let the hot burn gases out, are at the hot spot in the engine. They must have a special water spray. 
They're not content with just ordinary cooling. The valve is being cooled all the time it is on its seat. So the cooler the seat, the cooler the valve. To make sure the seats are cool, water is squirted directly on the valve seats. The cooler the seat and valve, the harder they are and the longer they will last. This kind of cooling keeps valves working efficiently and gives them a long and useful life. In the modern car, all the parts inside the engine get treated to a new kind of cooling. These water jackets run the full length of the cylinder, assuring uniform cooling over the full length of the cylinder wall. This also means that pistons are kept cooler, as they are always running against these cooler cylinder walls. Piston rings and pistons, properly cooled, keep in contact with the oil film on the cylinder walls. Oil temperature is kept down, cylinder bores remain truly round and straight. All parts run cooler. Now, here's a test that shows what the cooling system of the modern car can really do under extreme load and temperature conditions on a steep mountain grade. We're at the bottom of one of the longest, toughest hills in the country, the Nine Mile Hill between Clarkdale and Jerome, Arizona. A real test of any automobile's cooling system. One last check on the temperature gauge, and the test is on. A modern automobile pulling a double load against a Nine Mile Hill under a temperature of 110 degrees in the shade. It's 180 degrees, and we have a modern cooling system that doesn't have to ask odds of any condition anywhere, anytime. It can always keep cool so long as the water boy comes around. That's pretty cool, huh? Little bit of thermo right there. Very basic thermo. That's pretty neat. <laughs> this is the weirdest preview for the water boy I've ever seen. I learned so much. Yeah. Guys, modern cooling systems do this. I mean, guys, that hasn't changed much. I'm not going to lie to you. That that has not changed. <laughs> That's pretty... <laughs> you can take apart an engine. You'll see the cooling galleries. They're there. They look exactly like that. They, it doesn't change much because physics doesn't change much. Not, not that nobody has made like an advancement on a cooling system, but pretty much. To, I mean, the physics doesn't change. You know, one more. You want one more? Might be a good resource for today's topic. History of ASAT tests in space. God, I don't want to talk about this man at all. <laughs> I don't want to talk about this at all, bro. But yeah, all right, well, that's cool. I didn't realize the coolant wrapped around the engine like that. It's all about surface area, Typhoon. The more surface area, the, the more surface area that you can expose the water to, the wa water likes absorbing heat. It's very good at it. It's a very good heat exchanger. Go figure. Uh, I mean, that's like the basis of every power plant. For what it's worth, a power plant works exactly like that. 
It doesn't matter if it's coal, doesn't matter if it's oil, doesn't matter if it's natural gas, doesn't matter if it's nuclear. They all do that. They do exactly that. But they do it for a different reason. The heat generated by the power plant is used to boil water, just like the engine would boil coolant, right? And then they have the coolant go through a steam turbine. And that steam turbine, right, it'll, it'll spin it up, and that steam turbine is connected to a generator, right? And then the steam from there will go through a coolant loop, it'll turn back to water, and then there's a pump that pumps, right, pumps it right back in. That the heat exchanger that you see is those hourglass shaped cooling towers. That's that's all it is. That's why power plants have those cooling towers. Doesn't matter if they're nuclear, coal, whatever. They all have the cooling towers. That's very important. That's you gotta you gotta you gotta take the take water, turn it into gas, right? Turn it into steam, spin the turbine, and then flip it back. Every power every power plant that's not wind, uh, solar. And hydroelectric does that. What's the best engine? Uh, uh, that's open to interpretation. How did launching that shuttle go? Oh, but Tina, I haven't gotten it done yet. We were working on ground systems yesterday. There are some engines that are air cooled. Yeah, they just have heat sinks on top of the on top of the pistons, and then so, like a Porsche, back in the day. And a Volkswagen Beetle, for what it's worth, they don't have a radiator. No radiator. You don't need one. They use they channel air underneath the car, and the air flows over the engine. Now, keep in mind, air is a good heat exchanger. It's not as good as water. So the air-cooled engines were susceptible to heat. They could overheat. That's why Porsche stopped doing that. Do you have something to share about the turbofan engine? A turbofan? Uh... In the Blues Brothers, the engine threw a rod. What does that mean? You bent a rod end. It happens from overheating. Discovery, go at throttle up. There's an M8 Ford armored car on Bring a Trailer. One by. What the hell am I going to do with that? I mean, okay, that's not the point. I get it. Scrib, 13-month resub. So a turbo fan? Um... I'm not sure if I have one on turbo fans. Turbo fans. Okay, so a turbo fan is a jet engine. So, okay, they came up with this idea back in the day, all right? There's the turbojet, and the turbojet was invented by a guy named Frank Whittle. So, what does a turbojet do? A turbojet has air that comes in. And then you have a compressor. You have a compressor wheel at the front, and the compressor wheel sucks in the air. It compresses the gas, right? And then that goes into what's called a combustor. From there, the combustor basically just sprays fuel onto that air, and it. The combustor, in order to turn the jet engine on, you have to you have to hit a spark igniter. Like it's kind of like lighting a grill. Same concept. If you have a gas grill, you turn the gas on, right? The gas is flowing, but you need a source of ignition. Once you have a source of ignition, the gas just keeps flowing. You only need to hit the spark plug once. Jet engines work like that. Um, so if it hits the, there's flames inside of the combustor, right? From previously ignited fuel, right? And that lights the fuel on fire and the, you go, the fuel explodes, combusts, just like a car engine. And then it flows out through a turbine wheel. And that turbine wheel, because the gas is expanding, it's being accelerated, it spins the turbine wheel, and that turbine wheel spins the compressor at the front. It's connected on a common axle. Now, this is designed to generate thrust. All right, so this generates, the gas is getting accelerated out the back. <sighs> make, make thrust. That's a turbojet. They came up with this idea in the 60s called a bypass fan. So what is a bypass? All right, so you have that same turbojet design, same thing, but instead you have that same axle. So you have your compressor and you have your turbine wheel, but your axle is actually hollow, all right? There's a hollow axle in the center and there's a solid axle going through that, okay? So you have an axle riding inside of another axle like this. Now. You have your turbojet. Your turbojet is get, making thrust. It's making a lot of thrust, right? A lot of air is being blown out the back. 
Now that second axle is the key here, okay? So you have one axle rotating inside of another, all right? The turbo jet is making thrust, and that thrust pushes a turbine wheel, another turbine wheel, that is separated from the first turbine wheel. That other turbine wheel is attached to that floating axle that's inside of the first axle, okay? That axle goes through the turbo jet and out the front and is connected to a big frigging fan. That fan sucks in air. It sucks in air for the turbo jet, but that fan inside of a duct, a ducted fan, also makes a, a ton of thrust. You make way more thrust doing that. Now why? Why do you make way more thrust? Well, the jet engine spinning the small turbine wheel that's pushing a huge turbine fan, right? Uh, the fan is a lot more surface area. That's a lot more air to move. You can make a lot more thrust that way. You can use the turbojet as a way to turn the fan. You ever, you ever have like a pinwheel? You blow on a pinwheel, it turns? The jet engine is doing that. It's the jet engine, the turbojet, is blowing on a turbine wheel, and that turbine wheel is attached to the ducted fan up at the front. Therefore, you have air that's being used for thrust that's bypassing the jet engine. That's what a turbo fan does. Most modern airliners use turbo, turbo fans. So how does that look? It looks something like this. Take a look. It looks something like this, Obatine. So you have your main, main fan. That's the, that's the fan. Okay, this is, the, this is your ducting, right? And here is your bypass. This is a high bypass turbo fan. High bypass meaning more air goes through here than it goes through here. Now, sometimes in this particular diagram, this one has a gearbox. You have a reduction gear, so this can generate torque. This thing spins at high speed, goes through the gearbox, a planetary gear set, and this thing makes way more torque that way. You can make an engine that makes way more thrust. Now, what you have here on your main axle, right? You have two compressor, two compressor wheels, right? And these compressor wheels are what's called an axial compressor uh, because air flows axially over the fan. It flows front to back. There are radial compressors where air flows in from the front and gets moved radially out the side. That's a turbocharger. A turbocharger is a radial compressor, okay? So... These two that are attached to the fan before the gear set actually help compress the air. These fans upon fans upon fans upon fans on the fans are staging. Okay? So this particular high bypass turbo fan is a one, two, three, four, five, six. This is a six stage axial compressor turbo fan. Now, see where the blue is right here? Or the, well, this color right here? See where the lighter colored fins are? That's the turbojet. See? Turbojet right there. And then these ones that are that are the shades of brown. That's the that's the second axle. That's the inner axle. So the turbojet blows on the turbine wheel. The turbine wheel spins the compressors, then goes through a, then goes through a planetary gear set to the main bypass. It's just a jet engine blowing on a fan. That's all it is. Simple as that. That's it. Oh, that's kind of cool, man. That's neat. Is there a turbo? There is a turbojet in a turbo fan. Mm -hmm. That's what turbo fan stands for. Turbojet powered fan. And then there's a turboprop. Turboprop does the exact same thing, but instead of the jet engine being attached to the big huge bypass van it's attached through a gearbox to a propeller turbo turbo prop there you go dude jet engines are awesome they are so ridiculously simple and they make insane amounts of power they're really good turbo porp last for funny space news related material just to have fun you had tests with these what's that oh geez yeah yeah, yeah, that thing. Yeah, that thing is loud. The more you speak, the more I don't understand mechanics. Good to know. Alex, what's up? 
I'm trying to find it. Anything in here? Tess is in there. From a standpoint, balance of an inline six is best. Inline four for mineralization, V8 for power per square foot. Yeah, something like that, Tessa. Engines are all about application. Personally, I like V8s, but inline sixes have their place. Inline sixes are great for towing. Alex, I don't see your last. I, I don't see it in there. Yeah, jet engines are notoriously simple. Farm, or not farm, farm, you know this. Obatine, that has two moving parts. Actually, three if you, if you, if you count the oil pump. Because this thing needs to stay cool. This thing gets real frigging hot. Uh, particularly the, the shafts. The shafts need to be lubricated. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Yeah. No. Or too much friction occurs. And that can cause, dis that can cause discomfort in the jet engine. I'll go with a V12 over an inline 8, Tessa, right? How small could you make a turbo fan? This big? Dude, turbo fans, jet technology scales pretty well, actually. Yeah, you can make a little tiny boy. Uh, yeah, like this big maybe? Size of a football, an American football or a rugby, rug, a rugby ball? That's not what that's called. Yeah, V12. The Colombo Enzo Ferrari had it right, Tessa. The Colombo V12 is one of the best engines ever devised by man. What about blades? What do you mean, Obatine? Well, what? You, so the blades? Are you talking about like a helicopter? Helicopter does the same thing. A helicopter does the same thing. It has a jet engine, dude. <laughs> Don't. How do they design the blades? Oh. Um, I mean, where do you start? That that has to do with what's a principle called moment of inertia, or MOI for short. Um, so, Obatine, think about it like this, okay? I have a foot-long bar of plastic. This is ABS plastic over here, all right? Foot-long bar of plastic. Say it's about an inch in diameter, right? Just a bar. Like, whatever. It's ABS plastic. It's light, right? Because it's plastic. Then over here, I have the same thing that's made out of cast iron. Which one of them is heavier? This is not a trick question. Which one of them is heavier? Once again, it's not a trick question. The ABS one. The ABS one is is, is way lighter. The, the iron, is the cast iron is super heavy. Very dense, Right? Cast iron is one of the strongest things that we can make. Motors are made, most motors are made out, well, not anymore. Motors used to be made out of cast iron all the time because that was the most durable, right? So, they use, yeah, they use computational fluid dynamics or CFD to figure out the ideal, like ideal design. But here, the, the basic of it is this. You're de when you're dealing with something spinning, you have angular momentum. Angular momentum is caused by moment of inertia. So long story short, if I... If I attached this ABS plastic to a five foot long string, right, and started doing this, right, it'd be really easy to spin because it's light. It's very simple. It, had, it doesn't have a lot of moment. The moment is very low because it's very light. Easy to spin that thing. The iron bar, it would take a second to get going, right? The iron bar has more momentum, but it takes more power to spin. It has a higher moment. It takes, but it takes more oomph to go. Go at throttle up. With blade design on turbines, you're dealing with that exact same problem. You gotta find, you gotta find the blade that's the lightest, but you also gotta find the blade that has a lot of momentum to, because the more momentum that the blade has, the more air it can move, right? It's a balancing act. It always is. That's why some helicopters have five blades. Some helicopters have two. Hueys. You know, some have four, some have six, some have eight. It really, it really depends on what you're trying to do. There's a lot of variables in there. That's complicated stuff. D dude, I went on a deep dive one time, Obatine. I went on a deep dive for helicopter engines and jet engines and how they work, because I was trying to make them in KSP. Don't, don't ask. <laughs> Fun times. Um, we made jet engines by 
using the jet engines in the game. We well, we made a turbo fan in game by taking the jet engines in the game and blowing them on wings that were attached to an axle that had a reduction gear. Yes, we made reduction gears that had yeah. We made we were making gearboxes and stuff in KSP. It was difficult, fun but difficult. Um, so that's complicated stuff, man. It, it, there's especially helicopters. Helicopters are ridiculous. Uh, you think a car's drivetrain is complicated? You think a, a truck with four-wheel drive has a complicated drivetrain? Helicopters make a four-wheel drive car look like a freaking Flintstones car. <laughs> Those are the good old days. Yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dude, helicopters are insane. Heli... Oh my goodness. They're so ridiculous. They have gearboxes and differentials and and synchronizers and drive shafts everywhere. Like you you'd be you'd be surprised how a helicopter works. You'd look at that and you'd go, How the frick does that thing stay in the air? Like it's <laughs> here, let let me show you a Chinook for short. Uh, for just here. The the Chinook is insane. All right, it's it's ridiculous. So check this out. Discovery. No you have two jet engines, and these jet engines are going into a gearbox. See number seventy nine right there. Hey, King Kitten, sixty eight months. The gearbox. So like, if you think of a car transmission, right? A car transmission. You have one input shaft and one output shaft, and even those are complicated, right? That gearbox right there, seven number seventy nine, has two input shafts and two output shafts. And on top of that, it synchronizes the RPMs between the forward and rear output shaft. It has to synchronize it because the blades have to be synchronized. If they're not synchronized, they hit each other. There's a synchronizer gear in there coming from two jet engines that are attached to two turbo. These are actually called turbo shafts. A turbo shaft is exactly what I told you. It's a jet engine, but instead of powering a fan, it's just it just creates shaft horsepower. It's spinning an axle. It creates mechanical work. The the turbo shaft is going through a differential right there. Well, it's not really a differential, it's just a gearbox. And that goes into this thing. This black magic thing that has two drive shafts going in and two drive shafts going out. Now, here's the crazy part. The two drive shafts going in do not need to be synchronized. Okay? One drive shaft can power both of these blades. That's why there's two jet engines for redundancy. So the two input shafts do not have to be synchronized. The two output shafts are synchronized. Now, what goes on inside of that gearbox? Freak if I know. Nope, I have no idea. That's beyond me. There's a drive shaft. The rear output shaft of the gearbox goes to another differential. Up, well, not a differential. It's not a differential. It's just another gearbox. It's another gearbox that takes the horizontal power, makes it vertical, goes to the front shaft, and then there's a drive shaft that runs the length of the top of the Chinook that goes to another gearbox up here that powers the... Uh, I said that was powering the front. That's the rear and that's the front. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Ridiculous. Whatever that thing is right there, and whoever designed that, is a legend. That thing right there. That's ridiculous. That should not... That, Dude, let me just say, I used to, uh, there used to be a guy that streamed a lot that was a Chinook pilot, and he was telling me about this, and he was telling me that the guy that designed this thing in the 50s still has a job because it's that good of a design. I think spider gears, but in reverse, dude, that mutter, all, dude, uh, Daylock was telling me one time, I don't know if you remember that guy, he was telling me that the guy that designed this Boeing still calls him and asks him, like, hey, how do you how did you do this? They still talk to him and like the guy's like this old dude that's like 70, 80, 90 years old and still gets calls about gearboxes, the gearbox he designed 50 years ago because it was that good. <laughs> you had a CH 53E mechanic tell me that if they aren't leaking, they don't have enough oil. Yep. If helicopters are leaking oil, that means everything is good. If helicopters aren't leaking oil, that means it's going to break because it has no oil in it. <laughs> True story. 
How does it accelerate by changing its center of mass? No, center of mass stays static. Center of thrust changes. Boba team, that's a swash plate. Oh man, is your brain about to get blown? Watch this. So somebody said show the swash plate animation. Helicopters, I'm telling you. So Igor Sikorsky is the guy that came up with this. But dude, this is this is ridiculous. How does the V22 swivel its propellers? It has a it has a swash plate. Watch this. Oh, wait, hang on, Red Runners. What am I looking at here? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah there you go. Hey, thanks, Red Runners. It's called a combina combining transmission. Forward transmission and aft transmission. It's just three transmissions in it, whatever. Check this out. So, a helicopter... Helicopter blades have what's called a variable pitch. Okay, so the helicopter blades, when they're spinning, they can do this. And if they're turned down, right, you expose more of the bottom surface area of this, right, to oncoming air, and it forces more air down, more upward thrust. Okay? With that being said, that's just one axis of movement. That's called collective pitch. Because you're collectively changing the angle of attack on all the blades simultaneously. That gets helicopters to go up, and and obviously, if you pull, if you push the collective all the way down, you the blades will actually they won't go down, they won't pitch down, they'll flatten out, and you won't generate any lift at all, and the helicopter will go down. Gravity will do its thing. Now, that's one axis of what a helicopter can do. The other thing is called a cyclic. If you notice, there's another actuator over here. Okay, this other actuator causes this swash plate. To tilt, the swash plate can go up and down, but it can also tilt. It's it's a, it's around a huge ball joint right there around the center drive shaft. The swash plate will cycle cycle the the uh, variable pitch on the blades depending on where it is spinning around the axis. So when you turn the plate like this on one side of the blades, when the blades get to one side, they're pitched up, and when they get to the other side, they're pitched down. That modulates your center of thrust to the left, to the right, forward, and back. Combine that with the collective control, so you have your cyclic control, which is cycling the variable pitch on the blades, and you have your collective control, which is collectively pitching all your blades, you can get a helicopter that can move forward, back, left, right, up, and down. Igor Sikorsky is the guy that figured this out, uh, an American immigrant from Russia. A Russian, Im a Rus he, Im he emigrated to the United States in the 20s, I think. Sikorsky figured this out. Yep. Every helicopter flying nowadays uses a swash plate. Every single one of them. The Chinook has two of them. There's one on the front blade and one on the rear blade. Chinook has two swash plates. How do you, it, and mecha it mechanically interfaces with the cyclic and the collective. The Chinook has more pulleys in it than a Rube Goldberg machine. It's ridiculous. And all that has to work correctly, along with all the drive shafts and all the, everything spinning in synchronization. The fact that helicopters fly at all is pretty nuts. How do the Chemovs work? Chemovs have two swash plates stacked on top of each other. And they have a... Uh, a differential that spins they have it they basically have they do have a differential they got they the turbo shaft output to a gearbox and one gearbox spins one way and then it spins another axle the other way and then they go up and connect in one goes through the other like that turbojet design guys this is wild stuff it's ridiculous it's a rabbit hole deeper than the grand canyon i could talk about this stuff all day <laughs> what about the rear rotor the rear rotor is connected to an output shaft PCAS, and that's what your rudder pedals control. So if you have a reg, say like kind of a generic looking helicopter, take a Huey for instance. You have your cyclic and your collective, right? Then you have the rear tail rotor. Without that rear tail rotor, the blades that are spinning create so much gyroscopic precession that the helicopter fuselage will just basically spin out of control and the helicopter will eventually just flip over and crash. Sikorsky also figured that one out. So they have a tail rotor 
that's blowing air in one direction to keep the fuselage from spinning, right? That tail rotor also has variable pitch on it. When you, when you take your, your foot pedals on the helicopter and you move them left to right, it's changing the pitch on those blades in the back to either get that rear fan to suck in air or blow air to be able to yaw the helicopter in different directions. I'm telling you, it's wild stuff. And, and there's a drive shaft that goes out of your combination box that goes through the tail rotor. The tail rotor has a drive shaft going through it, and then it goes up into the tail rotor and spins it through another gearbox. Now, helicopters, with that being said, helicopters with two rotors on them, right? Like the Chinook, for instance, the front blade makes the fuselage want to go this way, and the rear blade makes the fuselage want to go that way. They actually cancel each other out. So the Chinook appears perfectly stable when it flies. Have you ever considered trying out DCS? I've played DCS before. It looks so complicated. Yeah, the Russians figured out a way to have a tandem... You have a tandem shaft. A guy named Kemov... Well, the Kemov Design Bureau came up with this. Yeah, double swash plates sitting on top of each other. One swash plate inverts the other swash plate, and it's on a gyro, like you, what you'd see on a BMX bike. It literally does the same thing. Anybody, if anybody here likes BMX bikes, there's... You know the gyro that you use for the handbrakes so you can move the handlebars 360 degrees? Yeah, there's one right there. Yep. The Kamov series of helicopters, so the K25, the K50, the K52, they all have this. Two blades on top of each other, and they cancel each other out. These, This is called contra-rotation, or contra-rotating helicopter. Why? Because you have two blades that are rotating in opposite directions. Their gyroscopic forces cancel each other out, and the thing just... Now, the Russians did this initially with the KA-25. They did this with the KA-25 because, well, you don't need a tail rotor with this design. You just need something to prevent side slip when you're flying. The Kemov, these Kemov helicopters don't have a tail rotor. That, that means you can make the helicopter really small. Now, there's a key to that. Why would they want to make the helicopter small? Why, why, why does it matter? Why would you want to make it small? I wonder, I wonder who knows. Who knows this? There's a very good reason why. Most of you got it. The Soviet naval doctrine basically didn't have an aircraft carrier. They didn't have one of those. The Soviet naval doctrine basically is as follows. The entire surface fleet is there to, to um, basically support their submarines. So the Soviets during the Cold War, they didn't really have aircraft carriers. What they did have is helicopter carriers like this. Something kind of equivalent to a uh, an amphibious assault ship like what the Marines use. Kind of like that, but also kind of not. It's kind of an aircraft carrier, but it really isn't. It's half It's half like heavy cruiser, half aircraft carrier. They didn't have an aircraft carrier. They didn't have a super carrier. They, they, didn't, they didn't do that with their doctrines. What they wanted to do was support all the... Uh, all the surface... They saw the surface fleet as useless. Like, okay, we make a big aircraft carrier, everyone's just going to shoot at it. Which is true. That's correct. I mean... It's true. So they made these, they made uh, a bunch of these uh, types of carriers, and what these things do are designed to carry helicopters around that support the submarine fleet. And the, you know, the smaller you can make the helicopter, the more of them you can fit on the dang helicopter carrier. Pretty straightforward stuff. Does that make sense, dudes? That's why they're small. That's why they made these KA-25s very tiny. And that's why they wanted, that's why they figured out that they wanted to do the contra rotators because you can make a helicopter that's about the size of a small car or, well, a large car. Let me put it that way. Little jet on the inside there. Who knows what those things are? Bonus points if you know what those are. Spoiler alert. 
There's a flap in the front for a reason. It is a nice yak. Check that out. Yak 38s have two jet engines that are facing upwards in the front, and then they have a they have a variable duct nozzle in the back, kind of like a Harrier, and that they're VTOL. They're VTOL plane. Hmm? Oh, yeah, I got flick. That's cool. Give me a Harrier any day. I think the Harrier is a better design than this. VTOL like the F-35. Yeah, kind of. The F-35 doesn't have a jet engine up here. The F-35B actually has a drive shaft that comes out of the front engine here. And that drive shaft is connected into a gearbox. And there's a ducted fan, Obatine, a ducted fan that points up and down. They took the idea of that turbo fan, right, with the F-35B. They took the turbo fan, they cut the front, they cut the front fan off, turned it 90 degrees, and then made a drive shaft that went to the jet engine. That's how the F-35B can take off like that. One engine powers the F-35B, and it, cre cre it creates thrust in the front and in the back. Mm -hmm. Crazy, right? Who did it first? I don't know. I think the Soviets did this first. Maybe. 1971. Eh, that's about the same time as the Harrier. Yeah, they're they're pretty cool. Pretty cool planes. Very very tiny. I mean, look at that thing. That thing is small. It's a small. It's a small plane. Look at the guy standing next to it. I bet the Germans did it. Mm, the. Germans never really got VTOL correct. If you're talking about the World War II Germans, they never, they never really got it exactly right. They did make a contra-rotating helicopter though, and it was pretty good. But they only made like two or three of them, and they, yeah, they got blown out of the sky, I think. Or well, no, they, I don't think they got blown out of the sky. I think they got bombed, if I'm remembering right. I, I guess, Tessa, who sold you guys on the idea, so it's clearly not too bad. How do the Osprey blades work? Oh, boy. The V-22 is... Uh... Thanks, man. Good to see you today. Right on. You know how to talk. You can sell me dirty underwear. Okay, cool. Um, so, okay. The V-22. So, think about this, fellas. Remember what I just told you about how if you have two blades, you need two cyclics and two collectives, right? 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 Also, when you have two blades with a helicopter, like the Chinook, they need to stay synchronized, right? Make sense? The V-22 does that. The V-22 has a drive shaft. It's two C-130 engines, first of all, and they're turboprop engines, right? Like on a C-130. Except... It's connected to a hybrid kind of three blade design. It's half it's half helicopter, half airplane. Because it's half helicopter, half, half airplane. They're like halfway between a prop, a propeller blade, and halfway between a helicopter blade. Right? So V22 has two of those engines. Those engines are on servos, hydraulics, if you want to be technical. They move up and down like this, right? On the end of those engines is a, a swashplate and a swashplate assembly, right? So, you have, when the blades are up like this, you have twin cyclics, so you can make the thing do this. You have, the cyclic can also make it go forward and back, and then you have collective, so the thing can go up and down. Now, those blades kind of, they don't really, but they are synchronized. I know they're synchronized. They do this, right? So, kind of like that. They, they, they make sure they don't interfere with each other, just in case. There's a drive shaft that goes radially off of the engines through the wings into a synchronizer gearbox. 
A combination gearbox is what they call them. That makes it so the V22, one engine can power both of those blades. Or two engines can synchronize up. So that combination box in the center of the V22, in the center of the wings, goes... It doesn't have any... It has two input shafts, right? But the input shaft doubles as also an output shaft. So one engine can power both of those blades on a V-22 if you lose an engine. They have to be synchronized because when it's in helicopter mode, you do not want the blades getting near each other. I don't think I need to say why that would be bad. Now, the V-22 has super advanced control systems. They have computer-aided control systems. And keep in mind, the V-22 came out in the early 90s. So by nowadays, now, now by modern standards, this is not too of a far-fetched thing, right? But in the early 90s, making a computer that registers when these things are upright for the control systems to basically invert and act like a helicopter and then turn and then have the thing turned down and have those same exact control systems end up co acting like an airplane is pretty ridiculous because think about it you don't want to activate the cyclic when the v22's engines are forward you activate the cyclic the v22 will spin out of control it'll go like this so there's a computer-aided control system that basically when the engines turn down, it works like it go, it's airplane mode. When the engines turn upright, it switches to helicopter mode with the same control system. That's ridiculous. Like, for, for early 90s computers, that's really frigging good. That's cutting edge stuff. Now give it four engines. The V-22 is insanely compli complicated. It's insanely complicated because when you want to take the best of a helicopter and the best of an airplane and combine them into one thing, you're going to make a complicated piece of equipment. Helicopters are already complicated. Airplanes, not so much. But trying to make a helicopter work like an airplane is very complicated. Now, there are more advanced designs for that. Gaffling, you already mentioned it. There's the V280, and then there's my personal favorite, the SB1. The SB1 is ridiculous. So check this thing out. You want to get into the what's cutting edge for helicopters, here it is. This thing is insane. All right? So, you have contra-rotating helicopter, contra-rotating blades, right? Like, like the Kemov, right? Very similar. And it has a propeller engine sticking out the back. Now, two engines drive a combination gearbox. That combination gearbox has three output shafts. One goes to here, one goes to there, and one goes to the helicopter engine, to, to the propeller engine in the back. Now, here's the crazy part. Helicopters don't like going fast, all right? They have a problem. There's this thing called retreating blade stall that basically prevents a helicopter from going I mean, even the fastest ones can go like, what, four, 400 miles an hour, 300, 400 miles an hour? I, I don't know. I know the Lynx is the fastest one, but I, I forget how, how fast it can go. It's not very quick. The V-22 was designed to bridge that gap, but this thing can do the same thing as a V-22, which is nuts. There are, from the three drive shafts here, there are clutches, like the clutch that you'd get on a car, all right? When the thing is in helicopter mode, all right, this thing... The clutch to this disconnects, okay? When it's in airplane mode, if I'm, if I'm understanding this right, I could be wrong on this one. The clutch is disconnected to these, and this thing turns into a giant auto gyro. What's an auto gyro? Well, an auto gyro basically uses helicopter blades pinwheeling using the oncoming air, that same retreating blade stall to spin them just with a, you have a fan that's pointed backwards and because you're going forward, the helicopter blade spins and that bit, the helicopter blades basically are your wings, right? It's called an auto gyro. Now, this thing gets around that retreating blade stall problem because it has two blades. So think about it like this. You have blades that are spinning on a helicopter. One of those blades, when it spins around, is always going to be facing into the oncoming air. The other one is going to be retreating. This creates a center of lift that's biased in one side. That's why if you let the controls go on a helicopter, it'll just corkscrew and flip over and crash if you let the controls go. This gets around that problem by having two blades stacked on top of each other. So the retreating blade stall from one blade is counteracted by the other blade. You basically just shut this thing off, gas this thing, and the thing 
it'll take off and the helicopter blades are your wings now. It's a gigantic, freaking, ridiculously complicated auto gyro. It's nuts. And then on top of that, this is variable pitch on the blades in the back, so that makes it so the SB1 Defiant, you can sit there, right, hovering, right, and then if you activate this, the helicopter just whoop, it goes backwards, it can go forwards. The helicopter can even hover like this. It can hover with the nose down. By having this engine pushing air backwards or pushing it forwards, right, towards the cockpit, right, have you have that propeller blade basically providing thrust in this axis and the two blades providing thrust downward. You can have thrust from the prop this way and thrust from the blades this way. The SB-1 can sit there like this. It could sit there and do that. That's ridiculous. That's that that, that the helicopters can't do that. No, 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 no. Yeah, a regular helicopter does not do that. That's not how that works. You pitch forward with a regular helicopter, you're gonna go forward. This thing can pitch down and it can just sit there. Which is it's it's ridiculous. That's that's an insane capability. That's right, Sile. My, my rescue helicopter is based off of this. Only I use jet engines, but yeah. Mm-hmm. I know about the quad tilt rotor. Yep. Mm -hmm. SB ones are the dude. That's like cutting edge stuff right now. They're they're testing the thing right now, and I'll tell you, it makes it makes the weirdest noise. It sounds like a drone. It's ridiculous. That's it's a crazy piece of equipment. Here, let me see if I can show you the SB one hovering sideways. It's it's weird, man. Like you look at you look at it and you're like. Uh, okay, it does that now. All right. All right. Let's see if I can find a video. Some pretty poggers things for space news. All right, cool. Here, let's see what we got. As you see a transition from forward and aft like that, Watch this. That the pitch attitude of the aircraft is relatively constant. Yeah, bio. Watch when it moves into when it moves into forward flight mode. Listen to this noise. There they are. They're spinning up the rear engine. They engaged the drive shaft. That's not the noise I would expect from that. Find the video of this thing sitting on its side. It's it's unbelievable. 
Here, let's see if this... Hey, we know what that is. Uh, let's see. Let's see if the promo video is here. It's fast, man. It can fly like an airplane. It can fly like an airplane because the contra-rotating blades defeat the retreating blade stall problem that helicopters have. That's why helicopters can't fly fast, because of retreating blade stall. Eventually, the thing will just spin upside down. This thing doesn't have that problem. You can see what it, see what it can do? It can just kind of sit there and just hover with the nose pointed down. Like, that doesn't seem like it's that crazy a capability, right? But when you think about the, the usefulness there, the usefulness of what that, that can actually do, like this thing can, this thing can sit like on a hilltop, right? It can, it can land on, it can land on a slope. A helicopter can't land on a slope. You try to land the helicopter on the slope, it bounces like this. You try to take off again, it's going to do that. This thing can sit there and it can hover and land on an inclined surface, which is unbelievable. Like that might not seem like it's crazy capability, but that's if there's no other helicopter that can do that. Can't the Chinook hover nose down? A little. The Chinook would probably be the closest one in capability, but this thing goes way faster than the Chinook. Not by much, though. The Chinook is actually the fastest helicopter in the U.S. Armed Forces, believe it or not. It's faster than an Apache. True story. It's the muscle car of helicopters. It has ridiculous amounts of power because you need ridiculous amounts of power to spin those blades. The Chinooks can do the Chinooks can land on slopes. But this thing this thing can do that too, right? So I guess there is other capability. But this thing can do that and it can fly as fast as an airplane. Which is pretty crazy. You get all the pluses of a Chinook and all the pluses of a um of a C130 basically. Not a C130, but yeah. So there's your deep dive into helicopters. Helicopters are ridiculous. The fact that they work at all is frankly amazing. Uh, and I think that's it. I think it's time for space news. All right, here. Let me find the Vega launch. All right, let's take a look here. Any news on the ISS? Not really. Alright. Let's go. The road to space. Where's the good stuff? Good morning and thank you for being with us on That's Road not to your Space. Voice. We are going live. Transmit electromagnetic signals that are we the people to prepare all the teams to go. the uh, most important they had a great uh, integration seconds. video before uh, oh. zero minus one minute so it's the period during which here let's take a look stage the p80 arrived first with a mobile platform it's uh, placed on the launch pad it's hoisted and placed in the mobile gantry that's the second Ooh. stage Zephyro 23, which is hoisted yeah, on top that. of the P80. It's and freezing in here. Want to trade? So we Bio, it's, uh, make this assembly of uh, stages. It's 30 C in this room right now. Is hoisted in the building and no, integrated. No, that's on the not right. Hang on. That's the maximum. Then we have the Avum that comes in a container. 26 in here right and now. And then it's integrated it's still on top warm. of the Zephyro 9. For the satellite, uh, sure, Elfish, I guess. they arrive in dedicated containers. And Isn't this the last slide of the original Vega design? Buildings. You know what? I'm not sure. Hydrazine. White rooms, escape suits. Yes, under controlled atmosphere. They're Absolutely. fueling there? And there is a certain number of operations that are required, like filling them up with uh, fuel, for instance. The computers, man. And computers heat this room mechanical up. mechanical and electrical checks before they are placed on what we call the clip. That's the Yeah, Shugan, and I know what you mean. When I hear when I hear English and then I hear it dubbed into another language, I'm like, shut up. I want to hear what you're saying. Stop it. Next phase and for next place the next space flight has no more Vegas listed, only Vegas C's. The upper Interesting. composite is then placed on a yep, mobile there you platform. Go. It's hoisted at the very top go. of the launch. Payload integration. It's See, Vega's a little small, little Avon. small baby rocket. Look at this, a little tiny but boy. All these um, are very. Uh, 
Oh, nice, Deepix. Missions, but our teams are trained. Then we remove the gantry. Thomas Pesquet tried to contact a French actor named Pierre Minet multiple times during his mission. He wanted to thank him through Houston for his participation in a recent aerial investigation movie. Pierre Minet never answered, however, as he thought Houston's phone number was a scammer. <laughs> Whoops. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Weather forecast. This information from uh, <laughs> so we took a moment All right, so here we go. This was the Vega launch with the Ceres satellite uh, this morning. Vega is what I like to call a yeeter of a rocket. A tous de didio. Standby control for the final countdown. 10, 9, 8, Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Engine ignition. Bye bye. Arumage. See you later. This is a heater. That's a heater rocket. Whoop! Into the clouds. Out of the clouds. <laughs> What have I done? My brains are going into my feet. These are impressive ah! I'm always impressed, and it's incredible to see that full daylight. I forget by No clouds today. It's absolutely wonderful. The Vega launch has been flying for 45 seconds. So you'd ride that given the chance? The no. Station. No, I'm all right. The 12th that would launch. kill you. For yeah, the year no, for not our human race. space, a perfect launch so far. So we've That'd just nice heard first. acquisition by Saint Jean. What does this mean? It's a go, baby, station go. based in the west of Guyana, and as the launcher is in altitude, thanks to the P80 uh, stage, we oh, have acquisition so by this station, uh, so that we have contact with the mm. launcher for the first phase of the flight. The P-80 is the Ain't first Ain't no way you're going to convince stage. me that okay. that is And in 40 seconds, it will be separated from the rest of the launch. The yes, it's active for flight. two minutes, roughly. Four more Vegas listed. And once cool, it's Thomas. finished its um, a boost and it's empty, yeah, it's we right. separate it. Nervous about James okay, so Webb? Yeah, we fast. all are. Yes, it takes off very fast because we have 230 tons of thrust that's delivered Stand by, by the P-80 and you have to separation. look at this in relation to the weight of the launcher which is uh, twice as low so man. it's an what a impressive clear shot. Uh, thrust and the launcher takes off very fast. Yeah, these were impressive uh, if images. If forced to launch on a non-curated launcher, what would you ride on? Proton. It's been confirmed. And we see that the Zephyro 23. Look at the P23 that you can the see it up there on the top we can left. See, and now we have the Z23 that uh, continues this thrusting. Why several stages? Why several engines? Well, the principle is to get rid oh, of nice dead when there, you don't need cool. it anymore. So when a stage is over and has consumed all its propellants, if we keep it on board, we carry dead weight in space. In space, I and don't that's know, Ryan. costly. So that's why we have different stages in a launcher, so that we can I mean, get rid of dead weight and nominal, as we go. The trajectory, the trajectory is, is nominal, nominal, says the DDO. It's incredible. After two minutes, we can still see uh, the launcher. Yes, it's normal. We are, we've gained an altitude, but uh, we're still a, not far from Kourou in terms of uh, geography. Great, for, but great soon footage, now, man. And then they switch to the telemetry view. Not bad, man. So everything seemed to go good with this mission. I was going to stay up for it, but then I decided uh, it would probably be better to be a little bit more responsible and kind of go from there. Oh, look. Oh, look at that, look at that little thing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the old school French rockets, huh? So that was the very beginning of uh, the uh, space uh, journey for France. We, had, we started from scratch. We had no space industry, no scientists working in space. No one knew how to build a satellite or a launcher, but the army 
was interested, we worked with them, and we set up the first research labs, the first... Uh, <laughs> Dude, the old school Kines logo, you see that? ...in house because nothing existed, and then little by little, the industry ramped up their expertise, and today we have the ecosystem that we all know. In military Dude, look at the old school Arian rocket. Be, uh, that was a, I think that was an Arian uh, 1. Power, but or was it Diamond? Civilian applications, but we also wanted uh, ballistic missiles for our uh, nuclear uh, power. So uh, public authorities were convinced of the usefulness of space and of a strong yeah, connection between grapes, space yeah. and national defense. So CNES is a key player in our national defense. Yes, in our space national defense for the... What were they peeping so there? Hold on. Hold on a, a second. Plan in our... National defense. Yes, in our space national National defense. Hmm. I wonder what the that was a diamond diamond rocket, the only rocket entirely developed by France. Hmm. GeoGuessr National Defense Edition. I know what that is. I'm pretty sure I know what this is. I uh, could be wrong. Hold on. Let me see. Is spin launch legit? Seems that way. Uh, let's see. What are you peeping? What are you peeping here? That looks kind of like Beirut, to be honest with you. But there's not enough piers for it to be Beirut. That might be Sever Morse. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Let's take a little, let's take a little look. Prove it? Okay. Nope, not a match. Okay, so it's not very rude. Yeah, oh, nice, like, and there you go. Let's see, it could be Severmorsk or Severodinsk. Could be one of those. Uh, let's take a look. No, it's not Severodinsk. Nope. Last time, last time we we caught them peeping on Angles Air Force Base, which is hilarious. <laughs> That's where all, uh, that's where Russians, Russia's bombers are, man. <laughs> Could be Murmansk. Nope, too, nope, not hilly enough. Nope, Sevastopol? Maybe. Uh, this river means, where's Severmorsk? I forget. I think it might be. Hmm. Try China. I don't think they'd be peeping on China. I don't think it's St. Petersburg. I didn't, I didn't see anything that I recognized there. No, no, nothing. Hmm. Kaliningrad? Kaliningrad? Nah, uh, I don't think so. No, it didn't match. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I thought that was Severn Morsk, but it's not. Hmm. Yeah, it looks military. Definitely military. For the of monitoring course, of space, uh, for uh, conducting space military What is that old Russian aircraft under renovation? Paves the way for the future. For I don't know. Future operations. Russia has a lot of aircraft. The military satellites that evolve in low Earth orbit. What are you looking at there? The way for the future. What are we looking at here? Oh, they're looking at France. Future okay. operations in space. It also controls the military satellites that evolve in low Earth orbit. Aircraft carrier. And it's a Chinese have it. 
supports the ramping up of uh, the armed forces in the space area. What can you reveal about major programs in the future? Well, PNES is involved in developing the future generation of satellites for, and in the coming years, PNES is going to continue working in close cooperation with uh, the uh, French Air, Air Command, Space Command. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Perfect definitely not a good Tessa. You're not wrong. So, what about watching this video and so tell us a few words about this. Oh, what else we got over here? See, la last time they showed a map, I knew exactly. I, I picked out exactly what they were peeping on, which is funny. I couldn't get it that time. Where's Katie Haswell? Bring back Katie Haswell. She's cool. This guy's cool, but I, I don't, Katie, Katie's better. Oh, then we're riding now. Bear back up into space. <laughs> that was the best part, man. Oh, this this guy. You guys do a lot of talking. That guy looks very French. Alex, I don't. I mean that in a in an endearing way. That guy looks very French. So does that guy. And okay, yeah, they all are all up and about, and they're actually smiling for a change. So that means mission success. <laughs> Very French. Anyway, that was the era, uh, the Ariane Space um, VV twenty Vega mission. Uh, that was this morning. I I was gonna stay up for it, but I decided to actually be responsible for a change and, and sleep. Uh, I got a good amount of sleep. How about you guys? Everything good? Yeah? All right. Um, so, uh, frick, I don't want to wanna talk about this. Uh, I've been basically getting asked this question for the past two days about what's going on. Um, so, the Russian Ministry of Defense the other day tested a, uh, um, a DASAT, uh, DAASAT, so a direct descent anti-satellite missile. Uh, the missile was launched from what I understand, it was launched out of Plisetsk, and it targeted a, a Cosmos 1408 uh, uh, satellite. It was a, a decrepit satellite that was from the Soviet era. Um, that Cosmos satellite was in... It was in about a 550 kilometer orbit. The test, unfortunately, was a success. And, uh, I mean, good, good, uh, good for them with the success and all, but it basically created a gigantic debris cloud that was, that's large enough to basically make the ISS, which is in a relatively similar orbit at 400 kilometers, need to change its orbital path. Now, there was no indication that this was going to happen. Obviously, I, ho I would hope there's no provocation either. Um, Cosmos 1408 is 450 by 490 at 82 degrees in climb. So, Cos... Here, let's take a look. Let's see. So, that's the satellite right there. Uh, or that was the satellite. Now, this brings up... This brings up another thing here. So, what's, what's so bad about anti-satellite weapons? Well, anti-satellite weapons do destroy satellites, but they also create a ton of debris. And that debris is bad. Why is that bad? Well... The debris is bad because, well, that junk satellite, missile parts, and all the pieces of the satellite, because it got blown to kingdom come, are now sitting up there, and they will not come down. 490, 490 by 460. I said 550. That was incorrect. Uh, even, even still, though, this point still stands. Uh, anything above 400 kilometers is going to take years to to, to come back down. It, there is still orbital decay up at 500 kilometers, but... Uh, for every 100 kilometers you get away from the surface of Earth, the time it takes to decay falls off exponentially. We're to the point where anything really above 600 kilometers is going to take millennia to come back down. Yeah, good times. So, 
this satellite, the satellite that they hit, and once again, great, good job. Good job on the success. Satellite that they hit is creating a debris field that's not going to come down for a long time. And it's another thing that you have to deal with. It created over 1,500 pieces of trackable debris. Trackable. There's, there could be thousands of other pieces of debris that we can't find. Um, for illustration purposes. Oh, boy. Oh, yeah. ULA released this graphic about, uh, about decaying orbits and how they work. So, there's a couple of things to kind of take into account here. So, keep in mind, this is stuff in dot space, and this is, this is a, a representation, but the Iridium-33 Cosmos 2251 satellites actually did hit each other in the 90s, and this was the tracked amount of debris that it made. Every one of those red dots is a piece of trackable debris. Now, the Russian anti-satellite weapon basically did the same thing. Um, this debris is annoying because it stays up there, it doesn't come back down, and now it's another obstacle that you have to get out of the way. Now, the thing is, if these pieces of debris hit other satellites, that'll, those satellites will create a debris cloud, right? And then those satellites will hit another couple of satellites. And then eventually it's going to cause a cascading effect where we can't launch anything into space. That's called Kessler syndrome. Uh, Kessler syndrome is very real. That's absolutely a thing that happens. That's not open for interpretation. It really isn't. If you don't understand why Kessler syndrome happens, you don't understand why if I let this flash drive go, it's going to fall. That's not open for interpretation. Everyone knows it's going to fall. You can do that. Oh, no, EJ won't fall technically. No, it's going to fall. And whatever you say is not correct. If you say anything otherwise. Kessler syndrome is a very well-documented thing. Basically, we could hit a cascading effect that could basically make it nigh impossible to launch things into space. So... This anti-satellite weapon and resulting debris from the Cosmos 1408 satellite generally didn't help us trend in the right direction for that. Yep. People disagree with that syndrome? Well, clearly some people in Russia do. <laughs> so. How bad are the Westford needles? I don't know what... I'm not sure what that is, username. Uh... So, this has prompted a lot of international criticism. And even, there's something that I couldn't figure out, okay? So, something, something strange is going on here. Because this satellite, this anti-satellite weapon that was launched, put Russia's own cosmonauts in danger. The ISS flies through the debris cloud every 93 minutes, or at least a part of it. Why would you do that? Why would you put your own cosmonauts at risk? You could, I mean, Anton and Peter are up there. Anton is the commander of the ISS right now. Why, 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 would, why would you do that? That makes no sense. That tells me, that tells me right there, you know, I, the first thing that I said was that, you know, Russia wouldn't do that. They're, they're smart enough to not launch something that could threaten their own guys on their own ISS, but apparently it does. So I'm not exactly sure why they would go about doing that. Once again, I don't know, man. I don't know how Russia works. I don't, they, they're do, they, they do their own thing, man. Last, please. Um, okay. Devil's Advocate here. By turning the sat into the debris, the individual debris pieces will re-enter faster on their own than the satellite ever would have done. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not how that works at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, <laughs> that is not how that, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 
Tessa, maybe, but no, that's generally not because now you, I mean, why? Why, why Dior? Who cares? It's a, it, it's a track satellite. You know where it is. Why make more debris? Why add uncertainty? No, I, I don't know if this was provocation or, or whatever. I hope not. I really hope not. Um, whatever it was, uh, guys, like, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure everybody here is on the same page. That's incredibly irresponsible. Like, I, I'm just going to call it like it is. I usually try to give the Russians the benefit of the doubt here, but that's a really stupid thing to do. Um, like, what, what, what are you, what are you doing, man? Like, dude, at least pick a freaking satellite in a decaying orbit or something. This satellite is not in a decaying orbit. It's, 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 it's in an orbit that's near the ISS. Who thought of this? You dumb piece of crap. Like, that's, it's not their first test, no. It's not the first anti-satellite test, but it won't be, and it won't be the last either. Uh, apparently, Russ Cosmos said they didn't know. Don't know. Maybe something to do with the X-37. I don't know. I don't know what would prompt this kind of test. Uh, there have been anti-satellite tests done in the past. Uh, India was the most recent one. India hit a satellite. Uh, fortunately, India's the satellite, the dummy target that India hit was in a 200 kilometer orbit. It was in a decaying orbit. That all came back down within a year. So that didn't create a mess. Tells me at least the Indians know what, that they're being responsible with launching into space. The Chinese did one. That wasn't in a decaying orbit. And that debris is still up there from what I understand. The U.S. did one in 2008 where we launched an ASAT missile from an F-15, which is... I mean, that's kind of cool. Strata launcher F F-15, that's pretty neat. But also at the same time, that also was a decaying satellite and all of that debris came down within a week. So, but guys, saying, <laughs> saying, you know, oh, it's in a decaying orbit, it's fine. That's still not an excuse. That's like running an electrical cable through water and saying, oh, the electrical cable is sheathed, it's fine, it'll be okay. No, no, it won't be okay. That's that's incredibly negligent. I don't, and guys, I'll be honest, I don't care who does it. I don't care if the US does it, I don't care if the Europeans do it, I don't care if China, Russia, whoever, I don't care. That's a really stupid thing to do, really stupid. You're literally poisoning the well. That's really dumb. You're poisoning the well that not only your enemies drink out of, or enemies, but you also drink out of. If Kessler syndrome hits a cascading effect, we can't launch into space. We're, we're stuck here. We're stuck on Earth. I, <laughs> you know where that's going to lead. That's not a good idea. This is, that's really stupid and very irresponsible. I'm, I'm frankly kind of disappointed. Is the method of destruction how, like how their ASAT technology works? It's a kinetic energy weapon. It hits it and it blows up. So, what's the legality of intentionally creating tons of space debris? I'm not sure, Pegster. I don't think there's a precedent for it, but I think we should move to ban anti-satellite weaponry. That's a really bad idea. It's very similar to nuclear weapons in that way. Everybody wants them, but if anyone uses them, we're screwed. Pretty much. Yeah, that's right. So, once again, I don't know if Russ Cosmos was told. I don't know if they weren't told. Uh... I don't, okay, what's this tweet? This is coming from Bill Harwood over at CBS. Bill Bill does a good job. He, he's very good. He's, he's been reporting about space for a very long time. ISS debris. The Russian Defense Ministry said in a statement, the U.S. knows for a fact that the fragments did not pose a threat due to the timing of the test and the orbital parameters and will be no threat to space station, satellite, or space activities in the future. So why did the guy that's commanding the ISS, a Russian, order the station to be moved then? Yeah, that's true, Rocket Guy. DARPA wouldn't tell NASA about what they're doing. You're absolutely right. Uh, 
I don't know, guys. Like I said, I'm willing to give the give the Russians the benefit of the doubt because I know they know what they're doing in space. Like I, you know, when it comes to ISS stuff, I trust them. I don't know. I mean, this. If you want to look at it from a complete objective point of view and don't move to outrage, right? Because it, I mean, it's very easy to. And I, 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 frankly, you'd be warranted here. This is a dude. What are you doing? Scenario. Uh, there could be dissimilar assessments of risk mitigation between how the Russians conduct spaceflight and how we conduct spaceflight. Or military spaceflight, let me put it that way. Ugh, I hate saying that word. Or that phrase. Um, and then why did Rogozin tweet that together with the U.S. they're making joint plans? Yep. Mm -hmm. Missing the beginning of this, what happened? Russia shot down one of their own uh, decrepit Soviet satellite S Master and it created a debris field that's that intersects with the ISS. Yeah. Okay. Um Yeah, exactly, Fozilla. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is like having an igniter testing station in a fireworks factory. It's true. It's not a good idea. Uh, like regardless of whether you have differential risk mitigation between the West and the East. That's, this is just, uh, uh Dan Hewitt. <laughs> nice. This is a NASA PAO. <laughs> if humans can still fly back into orbit when I get back to work, that would be great. Harwood with Van He's comments for today. Mark Van High or Van he Mark Van High told Mission Control Houston, the crew preferred notes on when passes through the debris clouds were expected, not distracting verbal warnings, unless the hazard gets worse. Otherwise, he said, we're going to consider the debris passing's routine. Ugh. Oh, boy. So, I don't know, man. Decades ago, the U.S. did a similar test, but specifically missed on purpose. I wonder if Russia did the same, but messed up. They're now on damage control. I don't know, Smirks. I don't know. Dude, I, I I don't know. That's that, it's all speculation. It's spec. It's frankly speculation whether Russ Cosmos knew or not. It's speculation whether this was provocated or whether it was a planned test. Did they mean to miss? Did they not mean to miss? I mean, Smirks, I I highly doubt it that the Russians would mean to you know mean to miss and not hit it. Like, dude, once again, they know orbital mechanics over there. They know what they're doing. Uh, you know. What's very weird is that NASA hasn't put out a formal statement, and instead Nelson was going journalist to journalist and telling them. That's a little strange. So will the ISS be in danger once the debris field lowers in its orbit over time? Yes and no. <clears throat> yes and no, Sonic. Um, it's not that the ISS is in any immediate danger, and that's probably where that Ministry of Defense statement comes from. The ISS is in no danger right now. But, it, on the other hand, it is another thing that you have to balance in your kind of portfolio of things that can kill you in space. <laughs> That's another thing you have to take into account, you know? And that... Eventually, you only have enough bandwidth for enough things that can kill you in space until one actually does. You know what I mean? Like, it's very... It's, very, it's dangerous, man. You're, you, that's Russian roulette, man. And fortunately, we had a blank that time. But <laughs> not journalist to journalist, there was a press release. Oh, okay. So it's not ideal. Um, yeah, the, the, it's not, not an ideal scenario. Audio captures the moment... Mission Control woke up and ordered them here. Let's see. Let's hear it. Let's let me let me hear the actual thing. Uh, hello. Yeah. To answer your question earlier about the spacesuits, we can support you getting into your suits at your discretion. It's your call. Just so you know, the Soyuz crew and has that 15 minutes. And that's, okay, well, there's no actual audio. Don't say you have audio and not have audio unless my headphones are unplugged. It makes you wonder how many cylinders there are in the revolver. Yeah. Yeah. So, 
this isn't a good thing. Um, it's not a good thing. And frankly, I'll be honest with you guys. You know, I'm not just doing this because, oh, the Russians did this to show for love. Dude, if we, if the U.S. did it right now, I would say it's equally as freaking stupid. China did it. India did it. It's, it, it, this is, it's a dumb thing to do. That's really, really not smart. Uh, the, dude, it could lead to something so much worse. But then again, that hasn't happened, so... Like I said, the ISS, that's just another thing that they have to deal with, which is great. But, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Sonic, I don't want to do that. That's the last resort, man. Last resort. Tom Cruise will go up and fix it. Yep, so... That's the that's that bit. I've covered it pretty sufficiently. I'm gonna refer anybody else to this VOD that wants to see it to, to this because I frankly don't want to talk about it anymore. I've said what needs to be said, and uh, I think we should move on. So, at least us and the Indians did it right. There's John. I said it once. I'll say it again. All right. This is the last thing I'm gonna say. Conducting an anti-satellite weapons test and having it being in a decaying orbit so it's all fine is like running a high voltage wire through a pond and saying it'll be fine because it's it's insulated. Yeah, it how long until that how long until that causes a problem? You know what I mean? Oh, let's just run this wire that's not rated to go underwater. We'll just put we'll just plug this extension cord into the pool. It's fine. It'll be fine. The the wire's insulated, it's fine. Yeah, okay, it might be fine for a little while, but how long until that how long until someone gets zapped? You know what I mean? Not smart. That like I don't care if we did it if we did it right or if the Indians did it right. No. No, 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 no. Bad idea. Dude, I don't care who does it. That's just a bad idea. <laughs> That, I, I don't care who does it. I don't care if we did it. If the U.S. conducted an anti-satellite test right now, I would say we are equally as stupid, and we deserve what we get. That's not a good idea. <laughs> space environmentalism might seem like something that, you know... Like, space environmentalism is a big deal. Because Kessler syndrome can happen. It's a cascading effect, and when it does, we're screwed. There's nothing we can do about it. We can prevent it, though. But space... Protecting... Keeping the airspace, airspace open around low Earth orbit is very, very important. Not just to the U.S., not just to Russia, not just to China. It's important for humanity as a whole, and that's why this. That's why I don't give a crap who does it. Anti-satellite tests are stupid. That's stupid. Who? It doesn't matter who. Does. Yeah, great. Chest, chest bumping. That's that's fine. Great. Good job. Idiot. If we lose low Earth orbit, we're going to be stuck here for a little while. Don't poop where you eat. No possibility of a debris collecting module for the ISS. Spammer, of course, yeah. If we could, There's debris mitigation techniques. Maybe Starship can help deorbit satellites down the road. But how are you going to go catch a little piece, a little nut? Like, what are you going to do to go and get that little nut? You're gonna you're gonna launch one entire rocket to get that to get that little thing because it's in a different orbit. At what point does it become futile? Like, okay, and you want a catch net, all right? You could have a catch net to catch debris. You know this debris can have tangent speeds that are like six times the six times the velocity of a rifle cartridge, right? Like, I don't care what you put up there, a rifle cartridge that's going seventeen thousand miles an hour. So like a bolt that's going 17,000 miles an hour, there's not much that's going to be able to stop that. <laughs> that's what I mean. It's a really good way to puncture your space your spacecraft. Space magnet, Kappa. Oh yeah, okay, so you put a space magnet near it, it goes right through it and keeps going. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's not a good idea. This is not smart, no matter how you spin it. It's not a good idea. Really don't do this. And once again, once we make a big enough debris cloud, there's no going and getting stuff and bringing it back down. You'd have to have some kind of big scoop thing. I don't freaking know. And debris makes more debris. That's right. 
Aluminum is not that magnetic, by the way. The... All right. Oh, you're saying that because most satellites are made out of aluminum. It was a joke, Da Vinci. Did you see the kappa that he put in there? It was a joke, but yeah, you're right. If I understand correctly, Kessler syndrome can only destroy satellites at the height of the first collision. Not necessarily, PCAS. When you when something blows up in space, it's going in all directions. So something that's going this way hits an explosion is going that way now. So you're creating basically a cloud that goes in all directions. So that no, it's not just it's not just it's not just orbits that are in that altitude. It's it's orbits that are slightly above it, slightly below it. Eccentric orbits, inclined orbits, you, yeah, that's a, re like I said, really bad idea. Hey, Hizbik, what's going on? And that that leads into another thing. Guys, space flight, it, okay, so I don't like entertaining the idea of war in space. That's a really stupid idea, but... For the same reasons. But if we're going to do war in space, you'd be absolutely stupid to like have like a gun up there or something. And this is something that the Soviet Union themselves and the Americans figured out in the 60s. Guns in space are not a good idea. That's not a good idea. So say you fire a thousand rounds at somebody that's flying close to you. you fly, that's a thousand bullets. That's a thousand piece of pieces of debris. And th those pieces of debris are going faster than most pieces of debris. Because you fired it already going 17,000 miles an hour, and now you accelerated it past that. So, it's not a good idea. Blowing stuff up in space is really stupid. Like, really stupid. And once again, the U.S. and the Soviets figured this out in the 60s. That's why we don't do it. <laughs> it's not a good idea. Uh, war, warfare in space isn't conducted like that. You don't need guns. You don't need guns. You gotta remember that everything in space is trying to kill you at some point. A gun is a waste of payload capacity. Honestly, all you need is a nail. <laughs> like, just just a nail or a hammer. Can you imagine, you know, you fight it, you're fighting in space, right? You, you know, you, you maneuver over to the other guy's EMU, you unplug his life support hose. He's dead. That's it. You don't need to shoot him. It's a wait that's a that 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 could cause problems because that debris could come back and kill you, right? Like, warfare in space is not even fought that way. <laughs> ASAT weapons... ASAT weapons would be like a sniper using a nuke to take out one HVT. That's really stupid. It, it, it's overkill. You don't, you don't need to do that. You could just use one bullet. And just... Bye-bye. So... Killing other humans, how medieval. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Turning your nose up at basic human instincts. That's good. Okay. Anyway, so, like, you go and you clip the other guy's solar panels or something. Or you go to your satellite and you have a little jet that pushes the satellite, pushes the antenna in the wrong direction. That's it. That's all you need to do. You don't need to blow up satellites. That's, that's not how warfare in space is fought. And this is not, like, oh, that's what EJ thinks. No. You don't need you don't need weapons in space. You could you could just fly a spacecraft near somebody else's satellite and deorbit it. A, a missile is a really stupid idea. Or you could just turn the turn the antenna on the satellite away from Earth, and the guy goes to find his satellite. It's not there anymore. The antennas are facing the wrong way. It's something as simple as that. Or clip the other guy's solar panels, like in the show, like in Space Force, right? Right. There's there's other ways to do it. It's a sniper using a frag grenade in a living room. Yeah, yeah, there you go. There you go. It's not a good idea. And like I said, that's all I want to talk about it. It's a really stupid thing to do. Like, I don't mean to take... Like, I don't like doing that. I don't like take, turning my nose up. And, oh, my God. How dare you do that? That's a really stupid thing. It's, a, it's, it's, it's dumb. That's it. <laughs> That's all. So, let's jump into Starship News. Let's see what's going on over here down in Boca Chica. We got three videos, I think, today. These are coming from our buddies over at NASA Space Flight. Uh, this footage was shot by Mary, uh, Boca Chica Gal, and Nick and Sweeney, the two full-time photographers down there that NASA Space Flight has. Yesterday, they did do some flap tests. They'll, we'll probably see that in the video. Pritchell has been encapsulated. 
cool. What are your thoughts on the old 007 movie Moonraker? It's about as realistic as Star Wars. Cool. Pritchell capsule, the next ISS module will be... Ready to go. Also, some lunar news. Highly specialized team to design vehicle for sustainable lunar surface mobility operations. Oh boy. Alright. So wait, Space Force was accurate? It's not too far off, Juice Bot. I wouldn't even cut the other guy's solar panels, dude. Just go up near the satellite and outgas near it. Literally sneak up behind it and tap on its shoulder, and then run away. That's it. That's all you got to do. Because you don't want to create debris, even if the other, even if it's the other guy's satellite debris. It's still a bad idea. All right, let's let's take a look. Let's check out these starship videos. Just crop dust them. Seriously, that's it. Jam potatoes in the Star Tracker. There you go. I farted in your general direction. Who knew the French were so good at fighting in space? I blow my nose at you, so-called recon satellite. There's ship number 21. Look at that. Wow, that looks way more concise than than 20 does, huh? Look at the tiles. I love it. It looks amazing. Yeah, there you go, caveman. There's many other ways to do it, but you wouldn't want to outgas paint like that because then paint chips go everywhere, and that that's debris. Those paint chips will solidify in the vacuum, and uh, yeah. Yeah, that's actually not a good idea. You probably shouldn't do that. Hey, XPZ, can they tile my kitchen next? Dude, I... When it gets to the point where Brimo and I need to buy a house, I'm debating... I mean, black tiles probably wouldn't be... Too, we'd need white tiles. But, also, I, I'd do the tiling myself. I know how to grab, grab tile, do you guys? How do they get the hex tiles to curve on the top like that? They have a couple of different shapes of tiles. It's not just hexagonal tiles. They have a, a one that looks like a baseball home plate. They have a couple of square tiles, and that's it, I think. Who wrote the moon rules number one on my car? You'd have to write okay on every tile. I'd do it. You get solar tiles. Uh, that would be good, but these are for a different type of thermal. Tough rock patio pavers. Be great if you had a house in Arizona. You wouldn't have to worry about the sun melting your deck, but then again, a rock can do that too. A little, probably a little cheaper. The MEV servicing satellites seem like they would be a good option for ASAT, ASAT stuff. Yeah. I know. Yeah, awesome dude. Mission extension vehicle. Ship 22's common bulkhead segment was moved in front of the midway f to begin Ship 22 stacking operations. Yeah, mission ending vehicle. Knowing us, awesome dude, it probably is double use. The Russians have an, e have an MEV as well. They tested it on one of their satellites a, a couple of years ago. Mission extension vehicle, drummer. It's a, it's basically a satellite that has a grappler that can grapple to another, to a, 
uh, a satellite that's out of fuel and it can use it to keep it in uh it can extend the life of a satellite or it could deorbit it the mev you made in ksp was sick thanks man I wonder if the X-37B could carry a mission extension vehicle. Yeah, sure, why not? Okay, taking off the counterweight there. Hey, just join. Why is it on fast forward? Ooh, look at the aero cover. Ooh, that's nice. What do you mean, Gothel? <laughs> yeah, I like remember that. I'm just like, I, witty joke. <laughs> Video in the stream looks sped up. Is this better? Does this make you happy? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna put it back to back to normal. I'll put it back to I'll put it back to normal. <laughs> Where's that aero cover coming from? It's not on site. It's some some contractor. Oh, look at that little baby crane. That's cute. Thermal blankets. No, please, 0.25. I, I'm not doing that, fellas. <laughs> I, ain't, I ain't doing that. Hey, it's all right, Gotham. Spin launch Kerbal build when? Do that, man. No, Fazilla, they're still there. I mean, we could be, could do the spin launch thing, I guess. Hey, Pop, what's going on? How are you? I still haven't replaced those tiles on 20, which is a little... Unlucky. Booster 4 is awaiting testing. Nice. Nice. Very nice. Oh, my home is a spin launch, Chad's now. <laughs> I. Okay. I mean, spin launch is cool, but I'll take fully reusable super heavy launch vehicle. Thank you. When are they gonna send one of these into space? Who, spin launch or SpaceX, Jim? The for SpaceX, the programmatic assessment, uh, the comment period and the evaluation period on the programmatic assessment for the environmental impacts of the PEA uh, should end in on December 31st. It should end at the end of this year. And after that, either A, SpaceX is good to go or they're not good to go. If they're good to go, I would expect an orbital flight test probably sometime late January, maybe February, perhaps, perhaps. Uh, if not, they're going to have to do what they need to do yeah, and go from there. Up. Hey, Wilkin. Welcome to Mission Control. Go and throttle up. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate the sub. So, a couple of months. A couple of months in 2022. I don't like that. All right, cool. These tiles, God, were never installed. There's no mechanical attach point right there. Though these ones down here were never installed. The ones that have white backs, those are the ones that fell off. These ones that silt that are silverback gorillas, those were ne yeah, they never put those on. 
Long story short, next year. 220, 2 for the means. Agreed. I agree, Grapes. It's what I've been... I, I, I said that since the beginning, dude. SpaceX wouldn't be going forward with all this if they didn't think the PEA was going to pass, like if it was going to be okay. If they're... If their environmental assessment wasn't good, they wouldn't have built that. Why? Why would you do that? You build it just to get rid of it? It makes no sense. 2-2-2022 is a Tuesday. Oh, boy. Remember when Elon said orbital by July? Yeah. Yeah, that didn't happen. He sets ambitious deadlines. Even if he misses him, he's still way far ahead of everybody else, guys. It's SpaceX Elonisms 101, dudes. Yeah, I agree, but that'd be really good. Nice cream. Yeah, Alex, that, yeah. Realistically, guys, we're looking at an orbital flight test. I wouldn't say in December, even if the the programmatic assessment was done and it was good to go. I still, the, the, this pad is nowhere near finished. The pad looks good. I'd say it's probably like 70 to 80% done here, judging by like all the stuff that's attached to it, etc., etc. 1073, liquid oxygen. You can tell it's liquid oxygen because of the way that it is. And that, you know what? That's pretty neat. Quarter two, 2022 at the earliest. Nah. When launch? Yes. is always wrong on deadlines releases. I hate optimists. I like optimists. They make such wonderful crying sounds when reality hits them. Wow. You guys must be real fun at parties. Don't you guys... Haven't you guys gotten it by now? I figure I would have driven the point home enough. You set ambitious deadlines in spaceflight. That's how you get anything done. Because the second you start turning into a realist, right, about this stuff, oh, we'll just be realistic about it. Guess what? It never gets done. So you can say whatever you want about optimists. But when it comes to the construct of spaceflight, optimists are the people that put flags on the moon. Realists are the people that make a space shuttle that confines you to low Earth orbit. Your best. Losers go home and whine about their best. Winners go home and get the prom queen. Carla was the prom queen. Elon sets these deadlines like this on purpose, guys. Because it's cracking the whip. That's all it is. Welcome to the rock. <laughs> I hope uh, I, I memorized the timing on the power plant. I hope no one has changed it. Third. Third with the fifth wheel. What do we got there? Oh, Raptor installation stands. Ooh, very, very, very nice. Pretty much, shooting in. That's it. That's all he's doing. Got a best user scope. Don't complain about best. There's plenty of bankrupt optimists, so I was being ironic. Touche. Well, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. Michael Scott said that. 
That's next for you, EJ. Engine mounting. <laughs> yep, yep. Yeah, would you look at the size of those car jacks? <laughs> cool. All right, we got a couple more videos here from NSF. Let's take a look. Dude, you just can't have that attitude with this kind of stuff, man. This stuff's complicated. You have to have kind of unrelenting optimism with spaceflight to the point where it's kind of like insanity, man. Or else nothing ever gets done, dude. It's a hard, it's a hard line to straddle, isn't it? <laughs> I like the way this guy does it, to be honest. Right, Thumb? I know what you mean. Yeah, see, this this still this thing still's got a little ways to go, man. It is looking pretty complete though. With that and with that being said, this is the fastest I've ever seen anyone put an orbital launch tower together. In an orbital launch pad for a super heavy lift rocket, right? Wasn't SpaceX supposed to launch that last month? Do you like asking questions after I answer them? Yes, or is it just me? It's not just you. I literally just said that a, a moment ago. My uh, drummer disagrees with me, yes? I don't think so. There was no tower there six months ago. That's right, man. This is the fastest I've ever seen someone slap together something like this before. When will then be now? Soon. Oh, you guys welding something up there. Oh, you guys having a smoke up there. We get it, man. You vape. Can you imagine working up there? That's like 150 feet off the ground where the chopsticks are. That's crazy. Thanks for streaming. Hey, no problem, Web. All good. I like getting sassy with chat sometimes. Don't think anything of it, guys. We're just giving each other crap for anybody for anybody that's newer. Or at least I at least the, the viewers that I'm giving crap. I hope I hope you know that I'm just messing with you. But seriously though, prom queen. Am I right? Am I right? Am I right? All right. Discovery, go at throttle up. So that's the uh, vehicle stabilization system and quick disconnect arm right there. They just call it the QD for short, from what I understand. Yeah, there you go, AJ. That's true. Hey, Jack, eight month resub. That scaffolding is so sketchy. Nothing but three quarters. Nothing under three quarters of it. Yeah, right? Dude, can you imagine these guys working on this thing? Winners go home and communicate with extraterrestrials. Wait, I don't think that's how that quote went, period. I still don't believe they're serious about catching it. It's going to be a sight to see. <laughs> It's either going to catch it or it's not. And either way, we're all going to have a lot of fun, right? 
can't wait to see the COPVs fly around again. I don't know, man. They're, like... Like, they built Mechazilla, right? They built Mechazilla. It's... You don't build that with the expectation that it might not work. You know what I mean? Like, I can't help but think that SpaceX knows something that we don't about catching boosters. <clears throat> now, personally, if you want my honest opinion, I think... I think how how it's going to work uh, with the chopsticks is the booster is going to have a horizontal velocity component to it. I think that that's how... I think that's their trick. So... Instead of the booster coming down like this, where you have the gimbal kind of compensating and that the booster can go to either side, right? I think they're going to come down slightly horizontal like this. The booster is going to fly in this way with a slight horizontal velocity component. Having it, having the momentum going in one direction, basically safeguards against deviations. An airplane has that. An airplane does that, right? Airplane keeps going in one direction, and there's not very much deviation left or right. I think that's what I think that's the trick. They're gonna basically have super heavy. Like if these are the catcher arms right here, super heavy isn't gonna come down like this. It's gonna come down like this, like kind of sideways, with a sideways component like that, and then it's gonna, it'll catch it like this, kind of like an like if you think an outfielder in baseball catching a catching a baseball. Same exact idea it's going to be that I think that's how they're going to do it because if you're once again you're coming down if you come down like this right there's a possibility that you're going to go left or right if you have a horizontal velocity component right on top of obviously coming up and down like this right and you kind of hover into it this way right you can clamp it right when the booster gets there once again that that's still it's it's not like that that is that oh that makes it easier right like it'll make it maybe a little bit easier but it, this is still all like very far-fetched stuff but once again i don't think spacex would even go about building this thing if they weren't at least somewhat sure that they could catch one but then to stop the sideways moment you'd have to tilt you'd have to tilt a bit and it will cook the tower no not a, if it lands if it lands then it'll just do this and then the the tower will just straight up absorb that shear force. I mean, Smirks, look at how thick these posts are. The that that tower is a thick boy compared to the ones that NASA uses. I mean, look look at the size of the columns. The columns are huge, and look at the concrete anchor that this thing is that this thing is on. Like, I, I don't think so. I think it should be able to absorb it. The, the booster will probably the booster when it comes in. Like if it's coming in like it's coming in like this, right? And they catch it, it'll probably swing a little bit. Yeah, sure. Who cares? I would that's where I would dampen out the force. I would I would try to just really put that thing right down and have the have the ta have the catch arms just have the booster do that. Uh, I would put some kind of th those tank treads up there for instance. That that could be used as suspension to absorb the hit. You know, we know that they're putting some kind of track mechanism up there. If it's something like a tank tread to be able to translate the booster back and forth, put suspension onto it. Now, don't get me wrong. You generally don't want sprung loads with this, right? You don't want a sprung load when you're picking something up because the spring can decompress if you move in the wrong direction and then spring. Bad news. But you got to remember, this is a landing pad. Dude, for all we know, there could be like a catapult mechanism like on an aircraft carrier that's designed to dampen out the horizontal movement. There's something on there. There's got to be. Because, dude, they ain't going to land this thing straight up. It's not going to go into the catcher arms like that. I would not do that that way. Because if the booster tips the catcher arms, then you're screwed. You're absolutely screwed. But if you're coming in sideways, right, the booster can kind of get into the right position. And then the, these things can come in and chopstick the thing, right? I, I think that's what they're going to do. But once again, I don't know, man. I have no idea. The tank track isn't a tank track. It's a big, big worm gear thingy. Interesting. Yeah, when you're coming in with a horizontal velocity component, there, it's it that you, it's easier to it's easier to steer the thing basically. 
That's why they call them chopsticks, Hellfish. Yeah, because it's going to be like Karate Kid. <laughs> the fly wasn't going like this, that's for sure. The, fly, the flying Karate Kid was going sideways, and you caught it sideways, right? Like, it wasn't going up and down. If I'm remembering right, it's been a while. Sile, what's, what's, what was your question? What sort of software do you reckon that SpaceX is to, uses to run simulations? Oh, you can, yeah, check out that AMA that Floating Disc posted. I think it was Floating. Floating, you post that? Sorry, my stream deck. My mouse, the mouse got caught on the stream deck. God damn stream deck. All right, there we go. KSP, how else do you think I got these ideas? That's a good point. It's a stream deck. Yeah, you you gotta say it like like the New Zealand New Zealanders say it. Stream dick. There's nothing wrong with how I said it. Make sure that Jesus is green and make sure your your lady bits are on internal power. Alright. In October 2020, NASA provided 53.2 million to SpaceX to demonstrate the transfer of 10 metric tons of cryo cryogenic propellant between two starships. Yep. With my dick cleaner, I never have to worry about Polish anymore. That's right, mate. Yeah. So, tuning actually... Check this out. Look at this. So, starship's umbilical. Take a look here. I've noticed some things about Starship's umbilical, guys. Uh, and I first started noticing this stuff from... Uh, I first started noticing this stuff from when I think it was SN, SN9 crashed. There was a close-up shot of Starship's umbilical carrier plate. Now, keep in mind, at the time, it was down the bottom of the vehicle. I thought We always thought that SpaceX was going to butt two Starships up, to, up against each other. But I don't think that the umbilicals are now radial. They're on the sides, but it is the same umbilical. Now, you, you can only see half of this, half of the umbilical. But the umbilical has one of these, and then there's another one over here. And then there's two, there's four things that are this big. One, two, three, and four. And then it, basically, it's symmetrical to this. And then tuning, check this out. There's pilot dowels. See these, see these, um tapered see these tapered uh, holes right there pilot dowels so because you have four line inputs right well one two three four and then two big ones right there you know what that tells me refueling along with the pilot dowels i mean don't get me wrong every umbilical has a pilot dowel because attaching umbilicals to a rocket is like attaching a bell housing to the back of an engine it's a real big pain in the butt and it takes a lot of time but I have noticed that there are there's enough lines here to support propellant transfer. I just have no freaking idea how they're going to do it. My guess is my guess is that they're going to use the hot gas thrusters or well, tank pressure to do it, which is obvious. That's like saying, "Oh, a ship is going to float in water because it's a ship." Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> What do you think about the satellite that Russia blew up? Ah, uh, which I already covered that. Not long story short, dumb. Stupid really stupid uh like like you remember that show remember that show jackass that's stupid and i like jackass for what it's worth like <laughs> that's where i'm at not no hello i'm dimitri ragozin and welcome to jackass now 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 it wasn't dimitri's fault it wasn't him his ministry of defense but that's another story So the dream is, say, a three-hour turnaround to fill those tanks, buy that, and launch again. Airplanes, Fuzzilla. So yeah, day-to-day -day operations for Starship. Day, you know, one mission, you know, one day up, one day down, one day up, one day down, like an airplane. How high is the atmosphere in RSSRO? No idea. Oh yeah, Thomas, I see it. Catchpoint moves on the worm gear. 
Thomas, how in the name of Sir Isaac H. Newton are they going to freaking get that right? That's awfully precise. Man. See last. Jackass was smarter than... The, yeah, that's right. I like Jackass. Right? I have the DVD box set. Yeah, I know. It's because it's 2009. I bought it in 2009. How high is the atmosphere in RSSO? Yeah, I'm not sure. This is like the... Yeah. Remember all that stuff? That's the, this is the toy car sketch. Yeah, that was bad. It's, yeah, it's a, it's a giant, it's a screw jack, basically, Thomas. It's a giant, hor it's horizontal, though. But, dude, that precise, that precise, man? How? How are you going to get that precise, dude? I'm not gonna watch the movie. It's not the original crew, and I'm not watching. I'm not watching any Jackass stuff after uh, Ryan Dunn died. I'm not doing that. Ugh, it's not the same. Falcon Nine lands with high precision. Yeah, Corzy, but with like less less than a foot deviation, that's gonna be tough, dude. It's gonna be tough. The part marked with the arrow can move up and down. How? So this thing can go this way, Thomas? Yeah, Neo, I'm with you on that one. So you think that they're going to catch it on this thing, on this little pad right here, and then this thing will octo-grabber the thing? It'll come up underneath it and whoop, lift the thing up? No, in the picture linked. The barge uses GPS, and Falcon 9 bounces radar off the deck of the barge, Corsi. Yeah, it's pretty precise, right? It's pretty damn precise, but yeah. Yeah, it's spin launch farm. Yeah. All right. Anyway, let's keep going. Yeah, of course. That's why. That's why I'm thinking horizontal component, man. But I don't know how a horizontal component will jive with that catch mechanism. That's very strange to me. I mean. My guess is that the bar moves up for the catch, catches the booster, and lowers it after the gear has moved the translation thing in place to move it to the center of the arms for the bottom points to lock the booster from swaying. Thomas, like, trying to catch the pegs on Super Heavy is 
way too precise. Do you think that? Do you think that they're gonna the grid fins will hold the load and then that that locator thing a jigger this thing will move into position and like rise up and catch the pegs. You think it could do that? Like, just trying to get it lined up with that damn peg is just. They're never going to land right on that thing. There's no way. Like, I'd be very surprised. I thought that the fins, you catch the thing with the fins. That eliminates a lot of precision, right? You don't need it to be as precise. And then that thing will move into position, right? And it'll move up and it'll attach to the pins and then they can move the booster. Well, the peg is lower than the grid fins. Yeah, see that and that because it doesn't make any sense that way. That's very strange. Yeah, I, I'm not... I'm not seeing it, dude. We were over here. There's the new no, new style of nose cone. Yeah, interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Mile, I'm with you on that one, dude. It's like a coupler versus the pneumatic line, right? Like, yeah. No, I haven't seen anything with that, Alex. Yeah. I haven't seen anything with the up-high fins. The tracks can handle rotating the booster. Yeah. I mean, it's that we're not seeing the finished product, guys, so it's hard to see. You know, it's hard to make out what, what SpaceX is trying to make there. That's a, a Ford Super Heavy Dome, stiffened. Yeah, Thomas, there you go. Oh, hey, guy. What's stopping the tank from buckling inwards from the landing force? Uh, grid fins are grid fins are have to absorb a crazy amount of aerodynamic load. Uh, basically, when they're doing grid fit things, Neo, it's actually a structural strong point on purpose uh, because they have to. Yeah, if look, if those grid fins can absorb. If the grid fins can absorb hypersonic loads, they'll be able to hold the booster up. The loads experienced by those grid fins is way higher than the than the hyper or the hypersonic load is way higher than just the shear load that would be imparted on shear load. Yeah, because it's horizontal. Yeah, that it would be way higher. Long story short, their aero controls, their hypersonic control surfaces, they're strong. Uh, that whole section of the top of the booster is super reinforced for that purpose. Nice, Panta. Mile, I'm gonna... I would guess that they catch it with the grid fins and then they align something to the pegs and that lifts the booster up so they can move the booster back and forth, right? Trying to land on the movement mechanism doesn't make any sense. You'd ideally want that shielded by something. But I, I, yeah, I don't know, man. It's it's very strange. It's cool to theory craft about it, though, right? You know what's crazy? SM15 flew. This thing went up to forty thousand feet. That's hard. You know, I understand. I understand what it was doing. I understand its hop. I understand the landing legs. I understand the Raptors. How they work. I. I get the aerodynamics behind it. My brain is having trouble rationalizing that that thing flew to 40,000 feet. <laughs> My brain's having trouble there. <laughs> that thing flew? <laughs> okay, we should watch it. All right, here.
that. Calm down, man. Damn. B plus 30 seconds, Starship 15 is airborne as we get a view of the three Raptor engines as we're powering our way to 10 kilometers altitude in today's right. test flight. Yeah, it was Erasmus, wasn't it? The official highlights has better uninterrupted views. All right, fine. This shot will forever be ingrained in my mind. That's so goddamn cool, dude. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's so freaking cool. I freaking love it. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that's so ridiculous, man. You gotta be kidding me. How the frick is that? Dude, and that, that, dude, look, look at where that is, man. That thing did that. That thing, that's that. Uh, like, oh my goodness. Yeah, I know, floating, right? That's ridiculous, dude. That's 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 absurd. That thing flew as high as a commercial airliner and came back down and landed. Right, Thomas? Yeah. It, it, yeah, it, SN8 almost landed on the first try. Like, pfft, all right. Yeah, right, Mile. I can't believe that. I can't. This is a, this is 
how the space shuttle must have felt, you know, when people first saw that thing come around. That, that it must have felt ridiculous. Like, okay, yeah, we landed in, we went from landing in capsules in the middle of the ocean that needed to be recovered by a huge navy to this. All right. And now we're going from capsules that need to be recovered out in the ocean to this. COPVs. Those are big boy bottles. Look at those big boy bottles. Insane in the brain. Yeah, I know, right? That's, it's crazy. Crazy. You what? Yeah, right? It's just... Alright. The, the, the crazy thing about seeing Starship fly to me is is not that I don't understand that what it's doing. It's the fact that I understand exactly what it's doing and it's actually doing it. That's crazy to me. Like, that's the part where I'm like, huh. I know what that thing is doing. And it's actually doing that. Okay. Yeah, that's weird. Alright. Yep, moving on. On another SpaceX note, Crew 4 had its final crew member assigned. Astronaut Jessica Watkins. Cool. No Ruskies. Oh well. Imagine feeling one of those nitrous... Uh... You want to run engine rich? Because that's how you run engine rich. The crazy part is it's still in development. The final Starship will be even more capable. <laughs> yeah, man, I'm happy with flying to 40,000 feet. I see that as an absolute win. Te the, literally, the next test is orbital. It didn't even bother trying to land it, trying to do the flip and land again. It's just... just... Okay. Imagine an alternative reality in which Dragon is landing propulsive. <laughs> it's not stupid. It's not it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Right? Yeah, it's witchcraft. It's like, you know, Maya, when I was younger, I see helicopters flying around. I didn't question it. You know, like, you're just like, okay, it's a helicopter. I see it. The, 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 the little thing on the top is, it's a propeller and it's pushing the air. I get it. You're like, okay, that's cool, right? And then you realize, then you figure out how a helicopter actually works and you're like, <laughs> how is that flying? <laughs> How is that a thing? <laughs> How does that not shear itself to pieces? Like, all right. The fact that I, the fact that I, you know, you, I understand, you know, like we figure out how this stuff actually works makes me appreciate it a lot more, you know? <laughs> makes me appreciate it a little bit more. It's helicopters. It beats the air into submission. Yeah, right? It's unbelievable. Oh, that's cool. That looks cool. Learns how it actually works. No. <laughs> D why? Yeah, that's. I believe that, Tessa. That, that's more plausible than what it actually does, right? It's not, but still. Yeah, Mile. It's it's unbelievable. I think the hardest part of this for uh, um, the hardest part of this for me to envision is that at some point they plan. For Starship to land with 80 to 100 people on it. The amount of proofing before anyone lets that happen is staggering. Yeah. It'd be cool if they turned SN16 into a wet workshop prototype, like once you land on Mars. Yeah, I would use it for something. I mean, you built it. You might as well get some money out of it. That will be an amazing ride. How the frick, how the frick is that even possible? That thing's just sitting over there in a field. No, they never did a test for it, Moto. They had the thing ready to go and... They had it ready to go and SpaceX opted to not do the test. They never installed the engines and they put it out in a field next to SN15. I think the design changed too much by that point. That's why I think they didn't do any more tests. That's why 16 was built and then never flown. And why 17, 18, 19 were... They started to make them and then they said, Nah, screw that. 20 is the new hotness. And that's the design they've been working with from there. All subsequent designs, 21 and 22, are based off of 20. They probably... Dude, they, I bet you the internals look nothing like 15 and 16. In fact, we know that the plumbing is a little bit different. We've seen that already. 
15 and 16 should be made into gate guardians. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, I'm not gonna say no. You're going real quick, man. That's a lot of rebar. I bet you I bet you ship 23 is skipped since it's the end of the 20 series before the upgrades on 24. <laughs> what the what the freak? What the frick you hit? What the frick, dude? Yeah, I don't know, Moto. 24, 25, something like that. You guys like stairs? We got stairs. Also, damn, right? <laughs> Ian, I have a feeling, it could just be me, I have a feeling that if the FAA opens the floodgates here, that, you know, the orbital flight test is going to happen, right? It's going to happen, but I have a feeling a second one might happen a lot quicker than we think, just judging by what I see around Boca. I mean, this isn't something that anybody didn't know, right? Like, they're already working on Booster 5. We've seen parts from 21, 22, 23, and parts of 24. We've seen parts of Booster 6. Like, only five flights in a year though. I, I think we're gonna see a second flight happen a lot quicker, <laughs> you know? Also, I just realized that when Starship lands on Mars, the ships that will land there will already be outdated compared to newer ones. It's true. I have a feeling we'll start seeing them on the frequency. We'll start seeing Starship stacks on frequency with uh, with the hop tests. They want. They got to get those tiles figured out. Like, look, see, this is this is one of uh, this is Brendan Lewis's. Uh, one of Brendan's diagrams here. He kind of shows the inventory of what's going on here. Like, look, we got three starships in the pipeline and three boosters in the pipeline, dude. Th this is not an accident. And we know how quickly they can slap one of these bad boys together. And the heck, this diagram is outdated because the nose cone is actually attached to the barrel segment. So 21 actually looks more like this, but it's in two pieces right now. Do we have, does Brendan, did Brendan do an updated one? Because this is even more updated. Yeah. Here's Brendan's Twitter, actually, here, if you guys want to check it out. It was linked in chat. Let's see, does he have another one? 15th of November. Yeah, see, look, look, this is not an accident. I'm going to guess that, I'm going to guess that these are the five orbital missions. There you go. And if they catch a booster, well, hot damn, that's great. Yeah, see what I mean? 21 is almost finished, dudes. 21 is almost done. <laughs> Booster number five just has to be put together. This is this is absurd, man. This is ridiculous. Of course, Lundprod, yeah. Like, guys, like, it's just kind of one of those take a step back, right? Because we're we look at Starship under a magnifying glass every day. We take a step back and <laughs> kind of think about it. If that orbital flight test happens in February, I'm going to guess there's going to be another one in March. That's my guess. SpaceX is going to want to, they're going to want to really get those tiles figured out. So we're going to see a couple of rapid prototype tests. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking once a month. It's got to be. Imagine like having four, four to five Saturn V five lines, Saturn V's lined up. If only five a year from Boca, they may make the oil rigs as fast. Now, Thomas, in the programmatic assessment, does that mean, yeah, it's five orbital flights, but that, that puts no limit on testing, correct? What's, so, I, I firmly believe that a super heavy booster is going to do something like Grasshopper. Uh, where it just goes up, comes back down for them to test the catching mechanism. 
testing had a limit of 10 or 20. See what I mean? We might, guys, we might even see hops, super heavy hops, interspersed with orbital flights. Oh my goodness. 2022 is going to be insane. Oh, smirks, I remember that. Oh, the, yeah, 5 plus 5 is 10. <laughs> Holy crap. I am not missing one of those. There, there, There's no way I'm not missing one. Oh my goodness. You know... Like we knocked we knocked the fanboys for SpaceX, right? But also at the same time, I mean I can see why people vehemently defend them. Like I do too, for what it's worth. Like this is absurd, man. Look. Look at what's in the pipeline. Frick you what's in the pipeline. There's more super heavy dude, more super heavy boosters exist than SLS cores right now. And I'm saying that as somebody that loves SLS. Like what the frick, man? Are you kidding me? How does that even happen? How does that even happen, man? What what the heck? No, I'm not gone to the dark side. I like I'll root on every rocket, but Holy crap. SN25 and booster number 8 will have the next major upgrade. So if these get done early, some earlier ships might not fly like SN16. Unfreaking believable, dude. Equal opportunity rocket lover. Evil Rays, nobody's gonna convince me that the best way to the best way to achieve, you know, sustainability in space is with less rockets. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's such a stupid thing to think. Why would you think that? <laughs> right? Like <laughs> What a dumb thing to say, right? Better have some in reserve when one is hit by Russian satellite to be savage. <laughs> Grab a prototype and reverse the view of Ryan Sludge. Poison, I just never understood that. Do, do the bureaucrats, the bureau, the, 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 st the rule eight stuff that slows down SLS, they understand that they make more money if you make more boosters, right? Like this must, if I can understand that, surely they understand that. So what's the, like, why stagnate the program like that? I don't understand, like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> oh, there it is, Thomas, yeah. So static fire tests, heavy, heavy tests, suborbital launches, super heavy. Starship land landing, super heavy land landing. Okay, so yeah, that's a good amount. That's a good amount for a testing regime, right? Crazy, dude. Crazy. And look, there it is. There's another booster right there. There's booster five. There it is. It's, it exists. Yeah, it's a little sketch, right? Yeah, right, Poison? I just don't understand. Like, what, what, like, you, you want the spice to flow. That You make more money that way. That's why uh, mass, mass produce SLS, please. We should see SLS cores rolling out like this, dude. The transport stand was already readied at the high bay for booster five. What the f Not a space question, but do you know if and where I might be able to watch 24-hour Sebring race this weekend? Your sister is pit crew for one of the cars. No way, Shy. I, I'm not sure. I'm sure. I'm sure somebody here will have a link somewhere. Check the racing. Uh, check the racing section in Discord. I'm sure somebody will find something for you in there. What are those ducts on Booster Five there? I think those are the vent line smirks. I think. That's the the, the, the tank depress. I think they covered them up, but I could be wrong. guy's the coolest RC car ever. Poison, self-propelled self-propelled modular transporters are something that I want, 
but I don't really have a use for. You know what I mean? It... I want one of these, but I don't really have a need for one, but it is really freaking cool. Leave the rocket. Take the Fezzioli. Right? It's very strange. I have people. I... I want one. I want one of those. I have no idea what I would do with it, but I still want one. A lot of people are, TJ. What would you do with it? Don't know. I don't think you can drive it on the road. I don't think it's a road going vehicle. It doesn't, I mean, it doesn't have like lights on it or brake lights or whatever. But that doesn't mean it couldn't be retrofitted. Right? Like, look at, look at that thing. That thing is so cool. Yeah, right? Build a house on it, right? Like, what, the, what, am, I, what am I gonna do with that? Don't know. I don't know. Look at that thing. And it, and it hooks together like Lego. Look at it. Look at... Dude. Alright, that's that's a really good e example of what an SPMT can do. Alright? Check this out. You see the wheels? Look. See the wheels at this end? They're extended. To go with the, the non-uniform pavement. See that? It, it, the pavement isn't completely level. And the wheels compensate for that. And they keep the top... They keep the the payload area, it keeps it flat. It auto-levels. That's ridiculous, man. That that's what SPMTs do. It's it's self-leveling. Just like the crawler transporter. Exactly. The crawler transporter is self-propelled. It's not modular, though. It's a self-propelled transporter. You down to redo the wiring, wiring lube on one of these? I could do it, Geeson. Sure, why not? Just give me a diagram for how it, lo how it works. I'll, I'll hook that up. The hydraulics, though, I'd have problems with those. Yeah, look at that. Toyota, GRB, Bird. Yeah, of course. Yeah, right. There's that thing that flew. There's that thing that flew higher than like 90% of airplanes right there. You know, right? It's percussive maintenance. Don't worry about it. Self-propelled modular transport. Exactly. Those those SPMTs are like Voltron. You could, or actually, a better example. Well, you can hook. The more you hook up, the better it gets. A better example would be like in Satisfactory with the Zoop tool. You could just keep coupling them together. You can couple all the SPMTs together. You you can have like 20 SPMTs as long as you have enough power packs. And it's not just long way. They can go together sideways too. Yeah. You can stack them sideways, and you can stack them the long ways. You can make you can make like a basketball court sized surface with like 10 SPMTs and that will just load level over whatever you want. They're really freaking cool. Just tap it in. Just, just give it a little tap. Tap, 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 a root. Yeah, yeah, SPMTs are underrated with what they do. They're really interesting vehicles. The Zwoop Mobile. That's right. You can zoop it. There's a porta potty over there on the left. That's nice. Man, that ultra high bay is going up quickly. That's kind of scary. One SPMT, two SPMTs, three SPMTs. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. There's the porta potty over there on the left again. I don't know why I park a porta potty right in the middle of the thing. It's weird. 
Oh, I'm sorry, that's a Chevy. Sorry, my bad. From this angle, it looks like they forgot the crane has to get out there. Yeah, how are we gonna get the crane out? Oh. <laughs> ATV question. The carburetor on my ATV is a variable Venturi carburetor. I have to turn on the choke to get it to rev all the way and have full power, but not idle. Any ideas? You're running too lean. Adjust the idle screws to run more fuel rich. If you have to put the choke in, that means too much oxidizer is getting in there, right? Too much oxidizer. You're running lean. You should have air fuel screws. Back them out one turn until you get a nice idle. Back it out. So let the motor get up to temperature, Sawyer, with the choke on. Open the choke and adjust those fuel mixture screws until, until, it, until it, you get a well, nice idle and then adjust the idle speed screw and you should be good. And suddenly I got the video post notification of a 540CI stroker big block going into independence. I just freaking finished the Elko trip last night, man. What? How, how does Derek do this? How does he do that, Buck? That's ridiculous. Nice, Jackery. There you go. Oh, look at him. Look at him. Look at him. Look at him. It's like a choo-choo train. Oh, <laughs> that thing is so cool. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But Hmm. Nice truck, Das. <laughs> no, look look on the left, guys. See the white truck? That truck doesn't say SpaceX on it, that's for sure. <laughs> Not the real NASA. I talked about it already, B Money. I don't want to talk about it anymore, man. Those are the those are ties for the crane, guys. Also NSF truck. I had to rebuild it, build it because I had fuel sit in it for five years. So they may have something to do. That may have something to do with it. I unfortunately don't know carbs as well as fuel injection. Ah, they, they're easy, Sawyer. Uh, carburetors are way simpler than fuel injection. It just looks complicated. Oh man, what I'd do to be an NSF photographer? That'd be pretty. That'd be pretty sick, ass right? Like. Yeah, Das told me about that a long time ago. He bought that before I did Route 154. Yeah. Yeah, NSF has the Starbase Operations truck. Old Tundra. It's okay. Like, I, I get it, it's a Toyota, but it's a, first of all, TRD Tundra. Second of all, that truck was made in Texas, so it's fine. It's fine. We'll give it, we give it a pass here. I mean, Thomas, I'm not going to sit here and say, like, your Photoshop isn't a better idea. <laughs> I'm, you know, I, I personally, personally, I think that looks better. <laughs> it's just, it's just, per just personally. <laughs> like, that's, that's all cool, but hear me out. Like, it doesn't look bad, man. It doesn't look bad. It don't look bad. That looks that looks right. Personally, I think someone's a bit biased. Personally, sh what? The frick? what? <clears throat> That's nice, but I like this. Yeah, right. Yeah, those are crane ties. That's the guy that's driving it, sitting on the bucket. Yep. Okay. You want to die with a man's truck. Not a little sissy truck like this. Now, Tundras are okay. Tundras are cool. It's Toyota, man. It's, it's fine. Take that, put Tesla motors in it, and put it on Starship and Moon Base idea. Um, Why no Hilux, though? 
They don't sell the Hilux in the U.S., Altio. We don't have the Hilux. We have the Tacoma, which is the closest thing. Which is kind of a Hilux, but it's kind of not. And then we have the Tundra. We have a full-size Toyota truck, which is cool. That's cool. You guys don't have that. Yeah, they don't sell the Hilux in the U.S. They haven't sold the Hilux in the U.S. since the 80s. But like I said, we got a big, big honking... That, that's a full-size truck. That's a, it's a Toyota half ton. They don't sell half tons anywhere else in the world. That's that's cool. That's a cool truck. I don't well at least I don't. They, they probably do. They, there's no way they just sell Tundras in the U.S. I mean obviously Canada and Mexico, right? But Eric, you could place a whole trailer park on it, and then you'd be able to move those under a dra yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah. Hilux is used for like 75% of the work trucks in Norway. If only you guys had one of these. I'm telling you, you had one of these, you'd be like, Hilux? All right. Yeah, that, that's a big Toyota, guys. This is like bigger than a Land Cruiser. Like way bigger than a Land Cruiser. Yeah, SpaceX Hilux, tech, Hilux Technicals patrolling the Starbase perimeter. Right. It was probably his idea. Ooh. The 2022 Tundra is pretty nice. Also, check that rear tire flex. Let me take a look real quick. Ooh. Oh, I like that. That looks really good. I didn't. I never liked Toyota trucks because I think that they, they look too flabby. They they look too like there's too they're too rounded. I don't I don't like rounded trucks. I don't even like the rounded Ford trucks. I think they look stupid. That looks nice. I like ooh. I like that. Yeah. I I like that. That that is sharp, man. That's sharp. The grill is a little bit weird, but this this whole ooh. Yeah, also, also, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't hate that. That's, that's, uh, that's, that's good. That is pretty sharp. Because they're found dead on Norwegian roads. Yeah, sure, okay. Interesting, Tan, okay. Also, no V8. They're not putting the 1UZ in that truck anymore? Oh, gross. Time to get a Toyota mug? <laughs> yeah, sure. No? A truck is utilitarian in purpose, Wisp. It, it's not supposed to look nice. It's supposed to work. Discovery, go at throttle up. Like a spaceship. Smokey, six month resub. Gonna get an excursion and make it a gamer's SUV? That's not a bad idea, dude. Don't get a Dodge mug, it leaks. <laughs> hey, fellas. So, we're talking about trucks, right? Look at the truck right there. It, it, now, I don't know what it is. I don't I think it's a Chevy. I don't care. It doesn't matter. But look at look at the truck and then look at this. And look at the guy up there on the, up up there. The, the truck is a good idea to get scale here. Not so much for the Europeans cuz they don't know what that you guys don't know what that thing is. It's a full-size truck. It's big. So like full size transit van. How big that thing is. <laughs> that that's a good drive home the scale picture. Look at that thing. Oh Jand, I know about that. That thing is really cool. I kind of want it. But what about the NSF Starbase Cybertruck? That would be cool. This 
Stupid American trucks here take up more than one parking spot and they're too long. Yeah, but see, the drummer, the people that drive around those trucks in England, they don't care what you think. So, so what? Make bigger spaces then. You don't like it? Turn off your station. I'm gonna talk to you the way I want to talk to you. You don't like it? Turn off your station. All right. Have a nice fight, Mike. Piss off. The Bagger 288. Jawohl. Ich ich bleibe Bagger. Yeah. Yeah. Wunderbar. It's good, Toto. It's, it's good. It's good. Da. Yeah, not da. That's Russian. I want to check out the second car, but I can't park it in your driveway. Just compensating? What are we compensating for? You not being able to make a big car? Erasmus Ranger Extra Cab is just fine. That's a fine truck. It's basically an F100, which is hilarious to me. Why well, you gotta make fun of their tiny roads like that? It's not their fault. It's kind of funny. Nighthound, I, I did it at the beginning of Space News. No, please make sure you're tethered. Holy crap. There's a bottom of the chopstick. Tiny roads, and we care about the planet with our cars not using tons of oil. Oh, yeah, oh, that's the reason. Oh, okay. Sure. Looks like they got most of the pulley installed there, you see that? Yeah, see, look at the umbilical right there. One, two, three, four, four. See the pilot dowels right there? That umbilical on Super Heavy looks a little bit different than the one on Starship, though. Starship looks like it's the same amount of stuff, but it's in different configurations. Hmm. It kind of is your fault, to must. Hey, you could have invented the automobile at any time, but you did. No, the Germans did. But also...
look at, dude, look at all that plumbing back there. Man, that's cool. Look at the flex hose. The flex hose for the fuel lines because this this thing is designed to, it, it's designed to kind of like pivot back. So it's it's designed to be over here like this and then it pivots back. Look at the dang flex hose, man. That's cool. That's really cool. Fellas, I heard the lightning detector go off. Oh yeah, those things help us? Yeah, of course. I heard the lightning detector go off. No storms nearby looking at the radar. Interesting. It just ticked. The amplifier ticked. It did that. Only a little bit quieter. Huh. That's weird. Okay, let's take a look. Let's see what we got here. The, the windings, the, the magnetic coils in the guitar can pick up lightning. It picks up the EMF from a lightning strike at close range. You hear it and it sounds like a in the in the stream. Yeah, see the valves? Those are valves right there. Electro actuated valves, one, two, three, and four, I think, I'm pretty sure. This is some kind of pneumatic system, but I'm not sure what that's what that's about. Dude, if it's hot in there, why you got an amplifier sitting there burning power? Because I never know when I'm going to need to play the guitar. I can shut it off if that makes you feel better. Bingo, turn your amplifier off. Oh, wow, I'm getting solutions to problems I didn't even know I had. You guys are so helpful. You know what? I'm turning it back on. Screw you, chat. He last. Ah, oh, TJ, I can't. I'm too busy being told how to do things. Yeah, I see the guy's putting the guy's putting the lattice down on the dirt berms there. Boost to four and the orbital tank farm. How's life been? Everything's good, Jay. Well, how are you? That's awesome, King Hidden. Very cool. That's dude, that's double neck. Those double neck guitars is cool. I've, I've always wanted to buy one, but I have no use for it, and they're super expensive. This is NASA space flights footage, Hammer Nails.
We actually had them custom built. That's cool. Man. Is that the one Das is affiliated with? <clears throat> yeah, Hammernails. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, dude, look. This was yesterday. Take a look. Zip. Zip. Yeah. Sorry, been a while. Hey, no problem, dude. You mean you need a use for it? How about just admiring it? I mean, that's fair. Little truck is protected by parent trucks. <laughs> it's waving at you guys. Yeah, did you see that? Hi, HVAC Dragon. The yellow hoses on top of the GSE, it's HVAC. They're maintaining positive pressure in there. They're pumping air into the, the area between the, the cryo shell and the tank inside of it. Keep air circulating over it. So it's called positive pressure. Piggly wiggly. Cars. Cars. so cool man I wonder what like there's these dudes that are standing there watching it right I wonder what noise that freaking makes like what does that sound like like, <laughs> like for some reason my brain is associating this with like a pneumatic noise like <laughs> you know <laughs> like but it sounds like a Tesla so nothing Buy us in flaps goes. All right. Like the sound of tiles scraping. Ooh. I wonder if you can feel a breeze. Well, with how fast we've seen those flaps actuate, I'll bet you they could. I'll bet you they could get a breeze going. Sure. All right. That was all the NSF videos here. Let's take a look. Anything else? There was a couple of other things here. Uh, what is this? All right. So this news is coming from Northrop Grumman. Something we don't get, we don't get a lot of. Here, check this out. Not trying to repost, but I really think you will like what me and Max made. Okay. Who wants more space art? How about a collaboration piece between me and Max? Okay, the SLS rocket rolls out from high bay three of head. Hey, yeah, not bad, not bad at all. That's pretty cool, man. She did the SLS. You did the mobile launcher. Soon. Soon. Should watch the Northrop video first before going into the press release. Video. Video? Highly specialized team to design vehicle for sustainable lunar surface mobility operations. Would Starship Heavy be useful at all? No. Think about it like an airplane, O-Force. Starship Heavy would be as useful as gluing two 747s together. Should go over the Boeing issue. Nope. What is this? That's awesome, Vulcan. Great picture. All right, let's see. What have we got? Introducing the Northrop Grumman Lunar Terrain Vehicle Team. 
From the first lunar lander to the space shuttle boosters to supplying the International Space Station with vital cargo, Northrop Grumman has pioneered new products and ideas that have been put into orbit, on the moon, and in deep space for more than 50 years. As part of NASA's Artemis program, we are building on our mission heritage with new innovations, new partners, and persistent drive to enable NASA to return humans to the moon with the ultimate goal of human exploration of Mars. Northrop Grumman will lead the lunar rover team. We will integrate industry-leading uh, expertise in from AVL, intuitive machines, Michelin, and lunar outposts. We will take lessons learned from former Apollo astronauts. Along with other partners, we are providing NASA with a vehicle design to greatly expand and enhance human and robotic exploration of the lunar surface. Yeah, I don't hate that. Further enable a sustainable human presence on the moon and ultimately Mars. The Northrop Grumman lunar rover is a spacecraft, but it is also the ultimate off-road vehicle. It is a science platform. It is a remotely controlled robot. It is a tool on the leading edge of the exploration of the lunar surface. The Northrop Grumman lunar rover team brings together expertise in mobility, autonomy, and mission engineering to enable NASA to perform its mission. When Intuitive Machines first began planning to provide commercial payload services and data services around the moon, we naturally needed a lander. And so we developed the Nova C. Nova D is really a natural extension of, of Nova C. Nova C allows us to test and demonstrate the critical systems for landing on the surface of the moon, for transit to the moon. The same systems that we have in Nova C, the avionics, the GNC, the flight software, power systems, those systems can be directly applied to our development of Nova D. That's our mid-class workhorse payload delivery for cargo mission. So we'll be reusing Yo, many of the turn? elements that Nova C will fly for at least three missions for Nova D. We will have propulsion, we'll have power generation and storage, we will have flight software with onboard compute capabilities. We will have precision landing and hazard avoidance. And all of these things will not only be packaged into a successful lander on Nova C, but the processes for putting them together in a manufacturing facility will all have been demonstrated multiple times. We at Michelin are very proud to be a part of the Michelin. North Grumman Lunar Terrain Vehicle team. In this partnership, Michelin has the responsibility to develop the tire or mobility solution for this lunar terrain vehicle. Cool. To accomplish this, Michelin will rely on its long experience developing products for NASA, our expertise with high-tech materials, and our know-how in mm. developing airless tires on the market today. Traveling back to the moon and Mars aligns well with Michelin's purpose. Today, we remain at the forefront of innovation and are proud to contribute to NASA's return to the moon. For the LTV program, we're going to be leveraging a lot of the expertise and technologies that we've created for our MAP Lunar Rover. Those include autonomous navigation in GPS denied environments, especially in unstructured <laughs> environments, yeah, in extreme temperatures and lighting conditions. We're also going to be able to bring forward our rapid prototyping capabilities and dust yes. mitigation strategies, and also the thermal and survivability Dude. capabilities that we've built into the MAP Rover will be ported over to LTV so that we can have extended mission cool. time frames and meet NASA's needs for the LTV program. I think this vehicle is gonna be the right vehicle for the Artemis program because it's gonna be reliable, it's gonna be affordable, and it's gonna accomplish the goals that NASA has for it to improve the scientific return and exploration capability of the Artemis astronauts. AVL is the automotive or mobility expert on the team, and as such, we're very honored and super excited to work as part of a very great team to make lunar mobility a reality. And as part of the Lunar Terrain Vehicle team, we will provide our years of experience in development, simulation, and testing of vehicle systems, as well as autonomous systems and electrified propulsion systems. The Apollo Lunar Roving hey, Vehicle, Jack or Schmidt. LRV, expanded the exploration range of the astronauts, enabling new discoveries. You. But it was not capable of exploration without crew drivers. The LTV will face mission challenges like no other. Over its 10-year design life, it will travel farther and faster than all other planetary rovers combined. 
covering um, hundreds of miles a uh, year. What? This will all be accomplished in one of the coldest and darkest environments imaginable. The LTV will map new areas of the moon with high definition cameras revealing details never before seen. Science payloads on the LTV will be able to help us understand fundamental questions regarding the three-dimensional geology of the lunar south pole. It will further hunt for ice and volatiles that are potential sources of sustainable water, power, oxygen, and fuel. Northrop Grumman, AVL, Intuitive Machines, Michelin, and Lunar Outpost, and in conjunction with former Apollo astronauts, are leveraging our considerable and successful past experience in space and ground mobility to provide NASA with a fleet of vehicles designed to greatly expand and enhance human and robotic exploration of the lunar surface and further enable a sustainable human presence on the moon huh. and ultimately Mars. Cool. All right, let's read the press release about this. <clears throat> All right. As prime, Northrop Grumman will lead systems integration, bridging its own flight-proven experience with space travel. Okay, that's all the teams. Northrop Grumman engaged Apollo astronauts Jack Schmidt and Charlie Duke to incorporate their hands-on experiences into the design for the LTV, allowing the team to optimize the vehicle for the needs of NASA researchers and Artemis astronauts. Interesting. Whoa, wait a minute. Yo, something I didn't notice. Uh, uh, um. Uh, what? Um. I wouldn't stand that close to that thing unless there's something that I don't understand here. Doesn't that, doesn't that, it, doesn't that bad for you? Is there something I don't, is there something I missed? Oh, yeah, it's shielded on the left and the right. It's fine, it's fine. Um, it could just be a radiator. RTG canisters are okay to be near. Got it. Are you telling me that that sucker is nuclear? That's cool, man. It Was there a contract awarded, Thomas, that I missed here? Like, is... Is there a contract out for a rover or something? Or did I... Did I miss something? Like, I don't... Discovery, go at throttle up. This is their proposal. GM has theirs. Oh, okay. Jonathan, 25-month resub. It's safe to be around. Just don't touch it. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you're getting more radiation from being on the moon. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, see, I want to see. Is, is this an RFP? Let's see. Let's take a look. Hey, Jonathan, 25 months. Yay. Thanks, man. All right, so let's take a look. NASA is asking American companies for additional input on approaches and solutions for a vehicle to transport Artemis astronauts around the lunar south pole later this decade. Okay, the LTV, an unenclosed rover that astronauts can drive on the moon while wearing their spacesuits, will need to last at least 10 years spanning multiple Artemis missions. Through a request for information, NASA is addressing challenges associated with the LTV's lifetime including surviving the long, cold lunar nights and options to transport the vehicle to the lunar surface. Lunar surface. Responses to the R... Oh, it's not even an RFP. It's an RFI. Okay, so very, pre very, very, very preliminary. Uh, so no contracts awarded, guys. Basically, NASA saying if you were going to make a lunar rover that could last 10 years, how would you, how would you go about doing it? That's all. Remo? Remo! Hi! What are you doing? I'm just coming in 
to say hi. Oh, I was wondering. I was like, I'm hearing the floor creak behind me. I'm like, what's going on? <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How's your chat? Chat's fine. Yeah, chat's good. That's good. I'm glad for chat. How's space? Uh, cold. Yeah. Yeah, it's fine. It's not really cold, but. What did the Russians do? Why? What didn't you want to talk about yesterday? They did a dumb. Oh. They did a dumb. Never do a dumb, Chet. Yeah, they... My analogy that I used to explain it to people was like running an extension cord through a swimming pool and saying that nothing bad will happen ever. Yeah, it'll probably work. You know, but it's in a swimming pool. It's probably not a, probably not a smart thing to do. Yeah, it's not something I would recommend. Yeah, yeah. That's basically that's basically it. It's nothing that's incredibly too bad right now, but also that could be a real problem down the road. Hey, Badger, what's going on? We never got the nuclear car, but Moon gets nuclear cars. Yeah, hey, that's all right. Easier said than dumb. Ruski did a dumb in Leo. Yeah. Oh. What's up, baby? Nothing. Do you need hugs? I do. Ow. Don't hurt yourself, you silly. Don't jump down the Fallout 4 rabbit hole again. Nah, I'm good. Can I get a stand up hug? Is that a problem? Well, I think that was all the space news, guys. Or are you just saying that because you want to give me a hug? The hell kind of loaded question is that? <laughs> All right. Uh, all right, guys. That's pretty much the end of Space News anyway. I think we got all of it. That's cool. What's going on with the Lunar Rover? Russia still did a dumb. Um, I think the last thing here is this bit of news. Check this out. So the, the Prichal, the, uh, the utility module, the next module being launched up to the ISS was encapsulated today in, in, uh, in preparation for its launch, which is in, I think, a week. So there it is inside of the Soyuz fairing. It's a, a utility module with a service module from a progress attached to the back, which is cool. That is cool. Yeah, they just use the service module from the capsules to launch the modules up into space. All right. Anyway, guys, Brimo needs a hug. So I'm going to start up KSP, uh, I think. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll go from there. What is this hellfish? Oh, I, I, first of all, that American military is ad blocked and I don't, don't care about that. Second of all, Brimo needs a hug. So, We'll, uh, we'll get to it. All right. I will be back momentarily, and we will fire up KSP while we're waiting. Here, let me do this. Let me do this. Hashtag win hug. Let me do this.